Hello, everyone. We are going to start now. If someone could confirm if they could hear me or not, then I could start today's session. Yes, I can hear you, Roman. Thank you, and good evening. Good evening. Thank you. So we are going to start the session now. I was just waiting for people to join, and I think we have waited enough, so we can start now. We are going to talk about some of the common emergencies we see in general practice. A common thematic approach to uh, address the issues of the patients and what needs to be done immediately. And then after that, we'll be looking into some specific cases as well. So we'll look into the actual examples from the exam and we'll see how to solve those questions in the exam. So this is mostly focused on PESKI preparation, but those of you who have been preparing for AMC clinical exam might also benefit from this because some of these cases might come in the AMC clinical exam as well. All right. Okay, we're going to start now, just, just a second, and then we'll start. So emergencies in general practice, what do you need to know? What kind of cases you get in the exam, how we are supposed to approach these cases and how you are supposed to present the cases to the panel. These are the things we'll be discussing. If at any time you have any questions, just feel free to write in the chat or you can raise your hand, unmute yourself and then we can discuss your questions as well. Now, the most important thing when you are doing these cases is what you need to remember is when we say emergencies in general practice, we are not simply talking about the cases which have urgent requirement for the treatment. We are also talking about those cases which need to be sent to the hospital immediately because there is not much we can do in the hospital in the general practice, and the patient requires immediate care. And when you think in this perspective, you will come across two broad categories of cases. One group group of cases where you have to do something in the general practice first before sending the patient to the hospital. The other group of cases where you know that the patient requires immediate treatment, but there is not much you can provide in the uh, general practice. So you have to send the patient to the hospital as quickly as possible. So that is why you will have to learn the approach to these cases. And uh, broadly speaking, we can divide these cases into the pediatric emergencies and non-pediatric emergencies. I will start with the approach to the pediatric emergencies. In cases of the non-pediatric emergencies or in cases of the adult emergencies, the only difference will be the first part of the pediatric emergency. In pediatric emergency cases, we have something called PAT or pediatric assessment triangle. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have heard this. This is a quick and easy way to assess the stability of a child by looking at the child before doing any kind of examination. Now, we all know that whenever we see any kinds of emergencies, we think about ABC, that means airway breathing circulation. But in case of children, this uh, should start by looking at the child before we touch the child and start our assessment. And that's what we call 
pediatric assessment triangle. When you get a pediatric emergency case, or when you think that this could be a pediatric emergency, the first thing you'll have to specify is you would want to assess the child by using the pediatric assessment triangle for a quick visual and auditory evaluation. That means you don't touch the child. You just look at the child. You just listen to uh, the uh, activity, listen to the breathing sound of the child, active, look at the activity of the child, and you try to make a decision by uh, click quick glance at the child's activities and the breathing uh, activities. And what does it include? Pediatric assessment triangle includes tickles, T-I-C-L-S. And here we are talking about the tone, interactivity of the child, consolability of the child, look at gaze of the child and speech or cry. And there are specific things that we'll be noticing in this, in the pediatric assessment triangle. Pediatric assessment triangle also has three components, airway, um, like airway, breathing, and circulation, which are, instead of airway, we have appearance here. And then the second thing we check is breathing. And then after that, we assess the child's circulation. And remember, we do all of this based on our visual inspection of the child, as well as by listening to the different sounds made by the child. So the first part is the appearance. In the appearance, we are looking at the tickles, uh, which includes tone, interactivity, consolability, look or gaze, speech or cry. And what we do there, in the tone, we are checking if the child is moving around and active or listless. So we are trying to see if the child is active or not, and if the child is moving around or not. We expect any young child to be active, moving around, doing things. If the child is lying on the mother's lap without doing anything, not making any sound, not doing any activities, it usually indicates that the child perhaps is not well enough. And so that is the first thing we'll be looking at. Then the second thing is interactivity, which is the alertness of the child. Is he trying to grasp the toys? Is it uh, trying to... Um, do things? Is he trying to play with the caregiver? Is he interacting with the caregiver? This is another thing we'll have to comment on. The third thing is consolability. Is the child consolable or not? Can the child be comforted by the caregiver or not? Or is the child crying incessantly? This indicates that the, there is a severe problem and most likely this is an emergency. Then you look at the gaze of the child. And here, this is the most important part. Does the child have glassy eyed stare? That means it doesn't look like the child is staring at you. It's just like the child is just blankly staring. It doesn't feel like the child is fixating on any particular face or any particular object. And just child is just blankly staring at the, at the vacuum. And the speech is another indication about the emergency. If the child's speech is strong and the cry is strong and the child is making strong sound, that that is a bit comforting. But if the, we, uh, the cry is weak, if the uh, speech is not vigorous enough, that also indicates ongoing problem, and most likely an emergency. So the first part of the pediatric assessment triangle, which is appearance, is you visually assess the child to see if there is anything that should make you feel concerned. Now, often the question I get after this is, but when are we going to do this? You start the visual inspection and the auditory evaluation of the child the moment you see the child, which may mean the child is waiting in the waiting room, and then you go out to call the patient and you see the child. Maybe the mother is carrying the child, or maybe you have seen the mother with the child in the lab. So your assessment starts from the very beginning of your uh, consultation. In fact, this is the pre-consultation assessment. The consultation has not formally begun yet, but you have seen the child and now you have made a mental note of what is going on. Because then you will have to decide whether the child is going to the consultation room for the regular consultation or the child is going with you. And that is the reason why we do this. We look at the appearance of the child. Now, the next thing is, just a second.
just a second. I'm having some issues here. I'm just fixing them. Okay, after you have checked the appearance of the child, the next step for you would be to look at the breathing activities of the child. And again, remember, we assess the breathing in the ABC assessment as well. But this time, we are not just assessing. We are not assessing by actually examining the child. We are assessing by looking at the breathing activities of the child. And let me show you how we are going to do that. Are you able to see the screen? I think... My screen share may have been disconnected. Can someone confirm if they can see the screen share or not? Yes, now we can see it. Okay, good. So as I was... Uh, so as I was telling you, So as I was telling you, the next thing you do is uh, you go for the breathing, breathing activities. And what you are looking for in breathing activities is you are assessing the work of breathing, something that you can see from distance and you make your mind whether this is normal or not. So how are you going to do that? What you will do is you will first assess the body position. If the child is assuming any particular body position. Now, you know what body position I'm talking about here. The first one is, you know that there is something called the tripod position where the child is child has this tripod position, drooling of the saliva, and you see the child is really grunting to breathe. And that indicates that, um, that indicates usually acute epiglottitis. Acute epiglottitis has become less common these days because of the vaccine we have for hemophilus influenza, but it's still, we might get a case of this. And that's why we'll have to keep an eye on for eye for that as well. And that's what you are looking for. If there is are any visible movements of the chest or abdomen that you can see, and if you can see if there is any flaring of the nasal ally, if you can see the the tractal tug, or in case of the uh, if if you are close to the child, can you hear any kind of sound, any kind of grunting sound, any kind of strider, any kind of wheezing, so that you can you can assess about the well being of the child. Then you can also uh, you can also look for the appearance of the child, that means the circulation. And what that means is you are looking at the, the color of the skin. Mostly you are looking at the color of the skin, whether it is a well-perfused skin or not, because that usually indicates there is good um, cardiac output and the child has been able to compensate for any kind of ongoing loss for any reason. But if you see that the child has dry mucous membrane or the child's skin looks dry or the eyes look dry, or there is mottling of the skin or pallor, then that indicates that there is some kind of emergency going on and that you will have to keep in mind when you are assessing the child. So this is how you do the ABC, the our pediatric assessment triangle. And this is the only path that you'll be doing differently in case of pediatric population. And then after this, whatever we'll be discussing will be the same for all the cases. So what you need to do here or what you need to remember is the panel will give you the case and will ask you, how do you approach the case? The first thing, first judgment call you have to make is, is this an emergency or not? In case of pediatric cases, I would recommend that start with the routine statement that in case of children, I'll first make sure the child is stable by using the pediatric assessment triangle, where I'll be noting the child's appearance, their breathing activities, as well as their circulation by noting their color or by noting their, um, by noting their any, by noting if there is any pallor or mottling of the skin and so on. And after this is done, I'll make the decision about whether the child needs to go to the treatment room or the child can be taken to the consulta consultation room for the further discussion. So this is pediatric assessment triangle. Before we discuss anything further, does anyone have any question about this? Usually after pediatric assessment triangle, I get many questions. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask them. No question?
Okay, if you don't have any questions, let's move further. Then the next part of the discussion revolves around um, what we call the, uh, the DRS-ABCD protocol. So what is DRS-ABCD protocol? This is an emergency protocol that we use whenever we have a child presenting with any, uh, we have any cases of emergencies. That can be anything. That can be a case of chest pain. That can be a case of, let's say, abdominal pain. That can be a case of persistent vomiting. It can be anything. Whenever we feel like there is a case which requires emergency treatment, then during the presentation, we have to say that I would want to approach the case using the DRS-ABCD protocol. But how would you know when to activate it? How would you know when to say that, um, that I need to activate the DRS-ABCD? Maybe someone can help me with the answer here. How would you know that this case requires DRS-ABCD? Uh, Dr. Roman, um, I think any unstable case needs resuscitation, needs uh, the first uh, mm. primary survey. So what, what is the way to find that out, that this is an unstable patient and I need to go for DRS-ABCD? Uh, after the uh, uh, PET assessment for the uh, child, uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 I can discover if he is uh, unstable and needs uh, immediate resuscitation regarding any uh, any any part of the pet triangle whether uh, respiration or breathing or circulation or or according to the appearance in this case i uh, uh, i decide his uh, if he's uh, in need for immediate resuscitation or not as an unstable yes in case of child of course you will do the pediatric assessment triangle you'll do the visual and auditory assessment of the child but in case of adults you'll have to ask this to the panel is my patient stable and uh, Sometimes the confusion is, should I ask this question in every case or not? Now, you have to use your clinical judgment. There are cases where you know that the patient is stable. For example, let's say that someone was, um, someone has diabetes and has come for the repeat prescription, or someone has been discharged from the hospital and has come to you for the, uh, the discharge summary discussion. In these cases, maybe it is it is all right not to ask about the stability of the patient. But if they say that there is a patient who has been vomiting for the last two days, I would want to know if the patient is stable or not. Or if there is a case of chest pain, I would want to know if there is if the patient is stable or not. So uh, you may need to ask this question directly to the panel, whether my patient is stable or not. And if the patient says that, okay, your patient is not stable, or they may say that, okay, your patient has started having seizure while waiting in the waiting room. Or they may say that your patient has suddenly collapsed in the waiting room. What do you want to do? Whenever they tell you anything like this, what they're expecting from you is you would start the DRS-ABCD protocol. And DRS-ABCD means DRS. These three things, what do they mean? Let's talk about that as well. DRS, these three things mean, first, check if it is dangerous for you to approach the patient, if there is any danger around the patient. So this is the most important thing. You would never put yourself in danger for any reason. And you have to mention this. Well-being of the doctors is considered as important as the well-being of the patient. And that's why you have to mention this. First, I'll see if there are any dangers around the patient. Then after that, I'll check the response of the patient. And then after that, I'll seek help. And because you are in the clinic, when you are saying, I'll seek help, you'll have to specify how you are going to seek help. And you can say that to seek help first, I will let the receptionist know that I have a patient who has collapsed or who is having seizure or who has chest pain. And then I'll ask her to call the practice nurse as well as my supervisor to the treatment room. So this is how you'll be asking for the help. And in these situations, it will be a good idea to be familiar with the surrounding of your clinic where you are intending to practice. So you can add those bits as well when you are presenting to the panel. Mostly in uh, pesky cases, whenever you show that you are familiar with your practice and what is available in your practice, how the setting is, how many receptionists you have, how many practice nurses you have, how many doctors are working, where the treatment room is, when you show that you have understanding of this, this usually has positive impression on the examiners or the interviewers. So always make sure that you try to include this information wherever it is relevant and wherever it makes sense. So you may say that I'll first let the receptionist know to call my practice nurse as well as my supervisor to the treatment room. And then after that, I'll take the patient to the treatment room in this process. And then once we are in the treatment room, I'll first make sure the patient's airway is intact. 
Now, what you can also add is generally I will ask the patient if they can hear me, if they can tell me their name, and if they are able to tell me their name without uh, stopping or they can finish one sentence, one full sentence without feeling breathless, that indicates the airway is patent. Now, this is just a practical tip in general practice. If the patient can talk in one full sentence without feeling breathless, that means the airway is intact. Or maybe you do not need to worry about the airway immediately. So that is one thing for you to keep in mind. Then the next part is, then you'll say that, then I, after this, I'll assess the patient's breathing and I'll check if the breathing is adequate or not. I'll check it for quality, rate, and then after that, I'll do the oxygen saturation. If the patient's oxygen saturation is low, I'll provide oxygen support. And most of the times when the oxygen saturation is less than 94%, we start providing the additional oxygenation. And generally in case of children, most of the breathing difficulties uh, in children should be supported by high flow oxygen through a face mask because in case of children, they will not be able to tolerate the others. Nasal prongs can be a bit stinging uh, for the children and face mask is more easier for them. Pulse oximetry can be used in case of children, but in very small children, you have to be careful because the readings may not be accurate, but it's still for um, children of um, adequate build or children who are... Um, uh, what you say, um, the big enough, then in these cases, then you can use pulse oximetry. So if you find that the pulse oximetry shows the oxygen saturation is less than 90%, that's an emergency. And that may require, that means the child may require assisted ventilation. In cases where it is less than 92%, especially in cases such as bronchiolitis or crew, they need oxygenation, continuous oxygen support. Generally speaking, if it is less than 94%, you start considering the, uh, the oxygen support for children. If the child is breathing adequately but is unresponsive, then in that case, what you do is you have to place the patient in recovery position, lateral recumbent position, after you have checked the airway breathing and circulation and you have not found any other abnormal findings. If the child breathing is absent or the child is hyperventilating, that means slow respiratory rate or weak effort only, then in that case, again, you may need to use the bag and valve mask device. Now, what you need to find when you go back to the clinic where you are doing your observation is you have to find out what support system is available in your clinic, what kind of masks you have in the clinic, nasal prongs, face mask, do you have bag and valve uh, mask or not? So you need to find out. Most of the clinics will not have support available for uh, um, artificial um, uh, oxygenation, that I mean to uh, say that for intubation, uh, so you need to find out what is available in your clinic. Do you have any kind of LMA or do you have any kind of devices that you can use to put the um, for the intertracheal intubation? Do you have any doctors in the clinic who can do this? And when you have this information and if you can include this in your presentation, this will usually sound more impressive. So that is something for you to find out. The next part is the circulation part. In the circulation, you need to find out first by doing the capillary refill time. Generally, if the capillary refill time is more than two seconds, then that indicates inadequate perfusion. But what you have to remember is in case of children, it can be quite tricky. First is in very young children, assessing the capillary refill time on the nail bed may not be reliable. So if your child is very small and you don't, don't see enough amount of the nail uh, on the uh, on the finger, then it is better to do, check that on the sternum. You can press on the sternum and see the quick return of color on the sternum in case of young children. In case of older children as well, what you need to remember is children are very good at maintaining the central perfusion. Um, and because of that, your capillary refill time, uh, so maintaining the peripheral perfusion. So because of that, the capillary refill time might still be good, although they uh, might suddenly get worse. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to look at the overall condition of the child rather than just the capillary refill time. Uh, generally speaking, if the child has bradycardia, that is less than 60% or uh, less than 100 in new case of newborns, then that indicates poor myocardial perfusion. So that you will have to keep in mind. Now, regarding the blood pressure, what is the uh, acceptable blood pressure uh, for different ages? Now, this is the list, and this is the list for the heart rate, respiratory rate, and minimum systolic blood pressure. The problem is, how will you remember this in the exam? Most often, it is difficult. I don't remember this. So I have come across a formula which can help us in the exam to decide whether the systolic blood pressure is adequate for this age group or not. So the simple formula is like this. What you need to do is, you have to uh, add 
two times the age of the child to 70. And that is considered the acceptable minimum systolic blood pressure, lower limit of the acceptable systolic blood pressure. So if I have a child who is two years old, then in that case, I will say that it will be 74. So for me, 74 is the minimum, minimum acceptable systolic blood pressure for this child. Anything below this, I will be... Uh, I'll consider adequate, inadequate perfusion. I'll consider that it, this could be shock. So I'll perhaps start preparing for the infusion. So this is one trick that you might be able to use in the exam as well. In case uh, of any, any unstable patient, you will then be checking disability and exposure. But you might see that in the list, we have more parameters than just disability and exposure. And the reason for that is that these are the additional things we should be checking in case of children. So in case of the older people, that means adults will be checking disability, will be checking exposure. For disability, we have the option of doing GCS, which takes a long time, and it might be difficult for you to remember all the parameters of GCS. So the shorter option is to check ABPU or to check patients, whether the patient is alert or not, whether the patient is responding verb to the verbal commands or verbal interactions where the patient is only responding to the pain or the patient is unresponsive. So this is a quick way that we can use in general practice instead of GCS. But um, the other thing that we will be doing is we'll be doing, the, uh, we'll completely expose the patient and we'll check if there are any signs of injuries, if there are anything concerning for us that we need to comment on. In case of children, what they say is in addition to this, you should also be looking for other things, which indicates uh, emergencies. For example, you should be looking at dehydration, I mean, hydration status. So what you can do is you can look for the uh, skin target, you can check, the, I mean, you can check the skin target, you can check if the eyes are moist or not, if you can check if the the uh, mouth, oral cavity is moist or not. In case of very small children, you can check the fontanelles, and that way you can decide whether the child is dehydrated or looks adequately hydrated. But then they say that in case of children, also make a habit of checking for the rash because rash in case of children indicates some serious pathologies, especially if the child is lethargic and if you think the child is unstable. And generally, when we see a child with um, lethargic child with rash, we are usually scared of or we are fearing possibility of meningococcemia, and that's why we don't want to miss that. And as part of the ABCDE, in case of children, they say that make a habit of routinely assessing ENT as well, ENT eyes and throat. The reason for that is children often have recurrent infections of these areas. Ear, nose, throat, as you know, are connected. And so children are well, with problem in one, may have problem with the others as well. And then if we make a, ha a habit of checking the eyes and throat as well, we are less likely to miss the emergencies in children. And make sure that you, you assess the temperature of the child and you check the tummy as well. So in case of children, the additional things we do uh, then in adults is we'll be checking for dehydration, we'll be checking their ENTs and eyes and throat, we'll be checking their temperature regularly, and we'll be checking their a tummy as well to see if there are anything that we can find there. So this is the approach to the, the emergency patients. In general, no matter what the diagnosis is, no matter what the complaint is, we'll be doing this. To summarize, in case of children, what we are doing is, in case of children, we start with the PAT, and then after the PAT, we do the ABCDE. And in ABCD, in case of children, not just we check for uh, disability, we check for dehydration as well. We not only check for exposure, we also check for the ENT eyes and throat as well. And we check for the temperature and we'll check for the tummy as well. In case of children, these are the additional things we'll have to mention to the panel. Now, um, so after this, what happens? After this, depending on how much time you have, generally after this, you will make a decision about transferring the child to the hospital. And while the, you are waiting for the transport medium to arrive, that means the paramedics to arrive to transfer the patient to the hospital, you will start asking questions about the event, what which led to this particular episode that you are trying to address. So what you are going to do here is we use the sample history taking and we can also use binds to get information about the child. So sample stands for signs and symptoms. So basically you will ask about the symptoms the child had before they had this episode. So let's say that if I have a lethargic child with fever, then I'll ask, so how did it begin? What he, the child had, he or she had, 
when this is started. So I'll ask a few questions about that. I have to ask about allergies because one of the emergencies that we should not miss is anaphylaxis. And not just that, even in the treatment, I have to decide what to give and what not to give. And during the emergencies, especially, we may forget to think about the possible al allergies or anaphylactic reactions to the medication we may provide. So we should make it a part of our routine assessment to ask about the allergies. Then after that, we can ask about the medicine the child is taking, any medicine the child is taking. For example, in asthma case, when they, you will ask, is this child taking, uh, is your child, whatever the name is, taking any medicine, they will tell you that, yes, he has been taking his asthma medication. So and that gives you an idea that maybe this is an acute attack of asthma. So you need to ask that question. And then P is for past medical history. If the child has ever been diagnosed for any condition, and then L is for last meal. This is important for you uh, to decide what kind of options you have uh, available in terms of anesthesia. And E is for events. What has happened so far from the time the, the problem is started? Now, generally speaking, in the general practice, what happens is you will not have time to ask all these questions. Most In most of the places, the ambulance will arrive in three to five minutes, depending on how far you are from the ambulance station. For example, in the place where I work, ambulance usually arrives in two to five minutes because we are almost next to the ambulance station. But depending on how far you are, you may have some time to ask these questions. So what you are simply doing is you are staying with the patient, you are assessing the patient continuously, and you are also asking these questions. And when you are telling this to the panel, this is what you'll be saying. I'll be continuously reassessing the airway, breathing, and circulation of the patient, especially after giving any treatment or if the situation of the patient, condition of the patient changes. And then in the meantime, depending on how appropriate it is, I'll also try to take further history by using the sample method, in which I'll be asking about any signs or symptoms, uh, the patient's parents have noticed, I'll ask about the allergies, I'll ask about the medication the child is taking, I'll ask about the past medical history of the child, the last meal they had, and the events which have happened since the problem started. And in, if you still have time, then in case of young children, you can ask about their birth history, their immunization, their nutrition development, siblings, and social history. But that may not be possible in emergencies. So I have just included that in case it extends to that part but most of the times, practically speaking, it's not possible. Now, um, after this, what do you do after uh, you have done all of this? Or what if the panel keeps asking you, is there anything else you would want to do? Then in this, those cases, it depends on what the situation is, what kind of information you have been provided with. But generally, after the primary survey, we reassess the vitals. We check the heart rate, we check the respiratory rate, we check the blood pressure, temperature, and oxygen saturation. In some cases where you find it relevant, you may check the blood sugar level as well to rule out the hypoglycemia as one of the causes, or even hyperglycemia. Uh, for the altered mental status and shock, as an example, when you will get the case of DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, this checking the blood uh, checking the blood sugar level will be the only clue give, given by the panel to you to make the diagnosis of DKA. And if needed, consider doing the ECG or urine dipstick as you find relevant. If it's a chest pain case, you might consider doing ECG after stabilizing the patient. If it's a case of, let's say, DKA, you might do urine dipstick and you may find ketonuria. So these are the things you'll consider. And you also may need to mention, maybe in the beginning, that when I'm doing this, I'll also be instructing the practice nurse to do certain preparation. For example, what the practice nurse can do for you. They can prepare the IV line. They can take the sample for you. They can do the paperwork. You can still sign it later, but they can prepare the paperwork. They can collect the sample and they can start the IV line. They can even give the IV fluid. So these are the things that you can mention in the beginning. And you can also ask the practice nurse to reassess the oxygen saturation of the patient, especially patients with the respiratory conditions or the patients with the poor myocardial contractility issues, which are usually the patients of heart failure or patients with, who have active or acute myocardial infarction. So these are the things you'll consider in these cases. Now, at this stage, after this, they will ask you, okay, now what do you want to do? So your patient is stable for now, what do you want to do? Basically, they are asking you, what decision do you want to make? And almost always the decision is to send the patient to the hospital. Now comes the question. They will give you some tricky situations. For example, in an anaphylaxis case, they will almost routinely ask after managing the patient that, okay, your patient is stable. What do you want to do? And you say that, okay, I want to send the patient to the hospital. 
and now they will create a hypothetical complicated situation. They say that the patient is refusing to go to the hospital because they think that the patient is now fine and uh, they don't understand why they need to go to the hospital now. So now they're assessing your knowledge. And here, the reason in an anaphylaxis case, you are sending the patient to the hospital is because of the possibility of rebound anaphylaxis, which can happen within the first four hours, more likely to happen. And that's why you have to observe the patient, even if the patient is stable for now. So any patient of anaphylaxis has to go to the hospital for further observation before they can be cleared from there. So these are some of the important things to keep in mind when you are approaching the emergency cases. Again, to summarize, First, you have to decide. Uh, first, you have to find out whether it's a pediatric case or non-pediatric case. Pediatric case, you start with the PAT, then you go to the DRS, ABCD, and at the end, you also mention what are the things that are possible for you to do in the clinic itself. If it's a non-pediatric case, then you just start with the DRS, ABCD. Both the cases are managed in the treatment room, usually in the presence of the practice nurse and your supervisor. You can ask help from other doctors as needed. Generally, your receptionist will call the ambulance and uh, your practice nurse will help you with setting up the IV line and getting the samples. Your supervisor will guide you and instruct you about what to do next. So these are some of the basic things for you to um, keep in mind. And usually in these cases, what happens is then they will tell you that, okay, the patient came back from the hospital after one week. So it's the patient has been discharged from the hospital and they have come back to you with the discharge letter. How do you want to approach the case? Almost always, whenever you get an emergency case in your PESKI, they will give you this follow-up. The patient has come back for follow-up. What do you want to do? So basically they're asking you, how do you do follow-up of an emergency case? And here the approach is going to be the same. First step is always you find out what happened in the hospital. And if the diagnosis was not established, you have to know what diagnosis was made. Then you have to find out what requests have been made by the hospital for the general practice nurse. What are you expected to do for this patient? Any specific request by the hospital or the specialist. And then after that, then you have to speak with the patient. And why do you want to speak with the patient? You want to find out how much they understand what has happened to them and now what is going to happen after this. So what treatment the patient will be on, what kind of follow-up plan will be prepared for the patient, what medication the patient will be taking, and if the patient requires any kind of action plan. Now, why action plan? The patient just had an emergency, which could have been lethal for the patient, which could have been fatal for the patient, which means patient needs an action plan. Anytime you have dealt with an emergency case, you have to prepare an action plan as well, because the action plan tells the patient what to do if things go wrong. It tells them about the signs and symptoms to look for. It tells them about who to contact if things are not looking good. It tells them what they can do before the help arrives. So all this information becomes vital for the um, survival of the patient in such situations. So you need to think about these things. So this is just a general approach to multiple cases. Um, regardless of whatever the case, this is how you would start. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the emergencies we get in the general practice and a brief approach to their management in the general practice, what we do at general practice nurse before sending the patient to the hospital. Before that, if anyone has any question, we can discuss those questions first, and then we'll go to those cases. All of these cases will be subsequently discussed in relevant chapter in the days to come in our basic course, uh, especially those of you who are enrolled in the course. And um, for others, you can still ask the questions now. Please go ahead. Dr. Roman, please, uh, in case of uh, if the patient uh, needs uh, adren IM adrenaline or, uh, or, uh, or glucose for, hypo, uh, for hypoglycemia, uh, mm -hmm. should I give it after, immediately after the uh, PAT assessment or after the RS uh, ABCDE assessment? At any time you think that the patient may have had anaphylaxis, you have to give adrenaline without thinking about anything else. And don't worry if this is not an anaphylaxis and you accidentally give adrenaline to that patient. The maximum that can have lead to is maybe the patient will have a palpitation, patient will feel anxious, patient will have more uh, restlessness for some time. But if you miss anaphylaxis or if you start thinking about what it could be and um, delay uh, adrenaline, that could be fatal for the patient. So it's more important to give adrenaline than to think about what it exactly is. 
Okay, and the same uh, for glucose, if uh, I suspect hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. The same yes, if I case... need to get... Yeah. Yes. So generally, in case of hypoglycemia, we make that diagnosis after uh, after we uh, check the glucose level for which we use glucose sticks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if we do the glucose sticks and we find out that the patient has hypoglycemia, in general practice, we have two options, whether the patient is conscious or unconscious. Usually, if the patient is unconscious, we give glucagon. So we have yes. got this hypo kit, which has glucagon. So we prepare the glucagon and then we give it to the patient. If the patient is conscious, then we give, give dextrose, 50% dextrose, 50 ml of 50% dextrose. This is oral? No, we, we give this uh, by injection. IV, okay. Yes. Thank you. Now, there is also a common confusion about can the general practitioners give IV medications or not? Yes, we can give. We routinely give as well. The only reason we don't talk about IV much is it requires more preparation. So unless it's an emergency, we don't go for IV. We generally prefer IM because it's quicker for us and um, it requires, there, there are less chances of complications with IM, but doesn't mean that we can't give uh, IV medications. Okay, and the glucose, the concentration, uh, uh, 15%, 1.5 or 5.0, 50? 5.0, 50% of 50 ml bolus. Okay, this for gender and adult? I was talking about adults. Okay, okay uh, if, uh, if he is a child, should I give... Uh... Then gen generally, in case of children, if you suspect hypoglycemia, you, uh, you give the lower amount of that. So it can be yeah. 15 ml, 30 ml, or 50 ml. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the other thing is, um, do we need to know the doses of the medication or not? No need. I think we should refer to the uh, therapeutic guidelines or uh, Australian Medica Medicine Handbook. Yes, regarding the doses of the medications, it depends on what medication we are talking about. If you ask me, to, do I need to know the dose of adrenaline? 100%. Because when the patient is, let's say that the patient has an anaphylactic attack, you cannot go to your computer and start looking for the dose. Every second counts there. So you have to know that by heart. So adrenaline, you have to know by heart. And one simple rule is generally we give 0 0.15, 0 0.3, and 0 0.5. Generally, 40 kilo or above or adult-like children, we give 0 0.5 ml. And we repeat as needed every five minutes by reassessing the child's condition. And in case of Children who are below 20 kilo, we give 0 0.15. And you might say like, but in the case of emergency, how can I know the weight? Just make a guess, make a logical guess. Okay, you don't have to give the exact amount you, because it may not be possible for you to know the weight of the child, especially if this is the first time you are seeing the child in the clinic, you may not know the weight. And even if let's say that the child is actually coming second time or third time, you may not have enough time to go back to the child's record and find out what is the weight of the child. Because for you, the most important thing right now is to give the appropriate dose of adrenaline to the child. So you look at the build of the child, you make your assumption how roughly, the, how what could be the weight of the child. Up to 20 kilo, go for 0 0.15 ml. Then for 20 to 40 kilo, go for 0 0.3 ml. And then after that, go for 0 0.5 ml. So that way you can quickly make that decision. So adrenaline, yes, you have to remember. And you have to remember that adrenaline comes in different strength. One is 2,000, one is 10,000, one is 200,000. But the simple thing is GPs only use one is 2,001. We don't give IV adrenaline. We don't give adrenaline infusion. So for us, one is 10,000, one is 200,000. We don't even need to worry about that. That requires continuous monitoring. That's why we don't even do that. Now, another thing that I would like to tell you is what medications should I know about and what medications dose should I know about? When you go to the clinic for your um, observership, there is something called prescriber's bag, a doctor's bag. So go and find out, find out about what medication you have on prescriber's bag, a doctor's bag in your clinic. Generally, there is a government, government recommend, uh, sorry, recommendation about what medication should be kept in the doctor's bag. If you go to the uh, go to the internet, go to Google and search for doctor's bag PBS recommendation, then you'll find the medicines that we are expected to keep in the clinic. And that is uh, something important for us to know. 
you may not get any question about this in the exam. That's fine. But if you get the question about doctor's back, what medications should be present in the general practice? What dose of the medication should be given to the patient in case of, for example, the patient with seizure, a patient with hypoglycemia, a patient with anaphylaxis, and you do not know, then that can be a reason for failure. So make sure that you know roughly what medications are in prescriber's back, find out what are the most frequent presentations in your clinic, and then also learn about some of the medications and the doses. You definitely have to know about adrenaline and the rest, just use your clinical judgment to find out what you need to know. So that is about the prescriber's back. Now, regarding the emergencies we often get in general practice, again, it differs from one place to another place. It also depends on the location of the hospital. If you go to remote areas in Australia, they tend to deal, deal with, the GP clinics tend to deal with all kinds of emergencies because patients do not have anywhere else to go. The hospitals are far away. But if you come to a place which are... Uh, well-resourced, let's say, then in such cases, general practice usually does not look after emergencies. Yes, there are certain cases where the patients prefer to come to the general practice rather than going to the hospital because of the previous experiences with the health practices. For example, maybe when last time they went to the hospital, they had to wait for six hours. So for that matter, they might come to general practice just to avoid that waiting time. Now, uh, regardless of what the reason was, if the patient needs to go to the hospital, you have to send the patient to the hospital. Uh, but the point here is, depending on where your clinic is, in what locality your clinic is, how far the hospital is, what is the size of your town, you make a different kind of combination of cases. So some of the common ones, regardless of where you are, and that you have to know are the ones that I have listed here, which we'll be discussing as quickly as we can. Now, again, as I said, all of this will be discussed in detail in relevant sections in our course. Myocardial infarction, one of the most important things you have to know. The presentation can be anything. The patient might come with chest pain. The patient might come with shortness of breath. The patient might just come with diaphoresis. The patient might also just come with abdominal pain, upper abdominal pain. What that also means is, if you see a case where the patient is presenting with these symptoms, you have to consider myocardial infarction as one of the possibilities, which means you must ask about the stability of the patient in the beginning so that you can decide whether this case requires DRS, ABCD approach or not. Otherwise, you'll just miss that. So you might do everything myocardial infarction requires for the treatment, but then the panel may decide that you cannot identify emergencies. So what happens is you may feel like, okay, I have done really well in the exam. I told them everything about myocardial infarction, but how the panel looks into this is, did this candidate identify that this was an emergency that had to be dealt with as quickly as possible? So that is something for you to keep in mind. What you need to remember for your exam is, how do common emergencies have presented in the exam so far? That's one of the ways you can use the recall for your benefit. Look at the recall, try to find out how the myocardial infarction cases have come in PISCI exam so far, in IME, in RCCP, in ACRA, wherever you are planning to appear in. And that will give you an idea about where it is important for you to ask this question about the stability. So generally, chest pain has been the most common presentation, but in some cases, it has also come as shortness of breath case, and it has also come as uh, epigastric pain case. Then uh, in case of myocardial infarction, what is the basic treatment protocol that we can follow in the general practice? Again, some people make the mistake of telling a lot of things which general practice does not do. So some of the, uh, the protocols you may have learned are the protocols that actually happen in the hospital. For example, talking about PCI, talking about thromolytics, talking about the um, dual interplatelet therapy. In general practice, those things do not happen. Even talking about morphine, giving the metoclopramide to control nausea and vomiting, these things usually do not happen in the general practice. And when you say these things, what you are actually showing is you are not familiar with your clinic. So while answering these questions, the best way to answer the question is there are some basic things that every clinic has, and there are certain things that maybe only your clinic has. And if you can specify those things in your, in your presentation, that's what they are looking for. One of the reasons for people to fail in PESCI exam is their approach is too general. That means, remember, you are being assessed for a particular position. That means in a particular clinic for a particular position, you are being assessed whether you are suitable or not, which requires you to be familiar with that position and what resources you have. And your approach should be based on that, not a general approach that everybody does in different other settings. 
So here, for example, I have written here that you will give oxygen, you'll give aspirin, you'll give nitrates, you will give morphine, you'll do ACZ and you'll call the ambulance. But do you have morphine in your clinic or not? For example, my clinic does not have morphine, so I cannot give morphine to the patient. Instead, in the, for, instead of morphine, we have sevoflurin. So we just have the sevoflurin spray and we give this to the patient. Now you might be wondering, but it will be quite painful for the patient. Yes, I know, but we don't keep morphine. Simple reason, morphine is one of the um, drug of addiction and keeping these things in the clinic puts us in danger. The clinic can be vandalized by drug seekers. And that's why we usually do not keep this kind of medications in the clinic for our safety. And this is a valid reason as well. So instead, what we use is sevoflurin. And when the paramedics have, uh, arrive, they can give these medications to the patient. That's why you can, when you are answering this question, you might say something like, so I'll give oxygen, I'll give aspirin, I'll do the ECZ. And then for the pain management, because we don't keep morphine, I'll give sevoflurin because that's the only one we have in our clinic. And then when the ambulance arrives, I'll explain what we have given to the patient and also give the handover documents to the paramedical team. So when you say this, it looks like you have been there, you have seen this, so you know how to work in your position. And that's what they are trying to see. The, can this guy manage to be in the position that he or she has been offered? So make sure that you are able to do this. And for this, you need to go to the clinic, you need to find out how they manage, what they do in cases of the, uh, the myocardial infarction cases, in cases of the, uh, let's say, diabetic ketoacidosis, what resources you have in your clinic. So that's that's something for you to explore. Now, before sending the patient to the hospital, sometimes uh, you may have seen that I will take the blood and for uh, I'll take the blood sample for further investigations and I'll give the samples and the paperwork to the paramedical staff. Now, I can I have seen this multiple times. Everyone saying the same thing that I'll take the blood sample and I'll give this to the paramedical staff. But what you need to remember is this is more appropriate for a clinic which is thirty minutes away from the hospital because there it makes sense for you to get the sample and then give it to the paramedical staff. In my clinic, we never do that. Why? The hospital is just five minutes away from us. So rather than keeping the patient to take the sample, I would rather transfer the patient to the hospital because it saves time for the paramedical staff. It saves time for the patient. And anyway, the hospital is going to take the sample anyway. So that, that's something for you to consider. How far your clinic is from the hospital and would it be reasonable for you to do what you are saying and do they do that and you'll not be you know you'll not be penalized for this if you say that in our clinic the regular practice is to stabilize the patient and prepare the transfer of the patient for that we prepare the doc uh, the paperwork and then we transfer the patient generally we do not take the sample because the hospital is very close to our clinic if you say this they will not penalize you for this if you still want to show that you know what samples they needed, then they either they will ask you like, okay, so generally how they ask is if they want to assess whether you know these things or not, they'll ask you, okay, what do you think is going to happen in the hospital? Which is simply their way of asking, do you know what investigations are done in these cases? So you do not need to worry. If they need that information, they know how to ask you these questions and they will ask anyway. But it is better to show them that you have you are familiar with these things. Anyway, now moving forward, and another thing is, in general practice, we usually do not give dual antiplatelet before it has been confirmed that the patient actually has myocardial infarction because it will increase the risk of bleeding. So we give aspirin, but for giving the other antiplatelet agent, we first have to make sure that the patient actually has myocardial infarction. So they will have to do the troponin, they will have to do the ECG, and then after they have the troponin result, they will give another antiplatelet agent as well in the hospitals. But we don't give it in our clinic at least. So other conditions that you might get in the exam are stroke, sepsis, asthma exacerbation, GI bleeding. So you need to know what generally happens when you have cases like this. A case of a stroke, what do you do in, our, in your clinic? In my clinic, we don't do anything. We send simply send the patient to the hospital if we think it's in a stroke. In case of sepsis, again, we generally don't do anything. We simply identify this is a possible case of sepsis. We send the patient to the hospital. Maybe in your clinic, they give their empirical broad spectrum antibiotics and send the patient to the hospital. But we don't do that because it's just five minutes. So I, we feel it is better to send the patient to the hospital. We just highlight in the handover document that the patient possibly has sepsis or the patient is in septic shock. If the patient is in shock, we stabilize the patient, give fluids, then we transfer the patient. Asthma exacerbation, generally most of the clinics have nebulizers. So you need to find out what um, solution they use in nebulizer in your clinic. In ours, we use Ventolin, Salbutamol, 
uh, maybe in yours, it's different. So find out what mixture, respiratory solution mixture you use in your clinic and uh, what is your protocol for breathless patient. So basically what I'm trying to say is this uh, handout I'll be sharing with you anyway uh, in the AMC uh, tutor group. And I think I have already shared it. So basically the point here is find out first what are the common emergencies you get in your clinic Find out what medications you give to the patient before the transfer. And that's all you need to say. Saying a lot of things is not going to change anything for you. Unlike AMC clinical exam in Pesky, they are trying to find out, can you manage? If you can manage, if they are assured, at least you know how to manage, they will let you pass. Statin, stat dose. No, we don't do that. Giving statin in MI is not going to change anything in the emergency. Statin is given for other, either for the primary prophylaxis or secondary prophylaxis. So in this emergency, giving statin is not going to change anything for the patient in, the, in, in, in this moment. So yes, when the patient comes back, we'll put them on a statin for the secondary prophylaxis, but not at the moment. That was, by the way, I was answering just one of the questions in the chat. Okay, uh, so these are some of the things to consider. I'll also show you some of the cases and how they are asked in the exam and how we approach those cases, how we take the history, how we do uh, talk about different things and how those questions are asked by the panel just in a minute. But before we proceed to that, if anyone has any question, please feel free to ask those questions. So no questions. Hello, doctor. Hello, doctor. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. I have a question in case of emergency. It, it, emergency cases. First of all, I don't know whether it is in before pet in case of child or young children. Mm -hmm. Before assessment, I go and and without taking a bit history, why I mm -hmm. can confirm the anaphylaxis? Well, unless patient, I would like to at least examine the oral cavity whether it is bleep and tongue is become swollen, etc. Mm -hmm. So in that case, without taking a bit collateral history or anything else, how can I be confirmed and then start the adrenaline? Or I give him some clue whether what has happened, what is when it has happened, anything, anything inciting isn't is there only insect bite or whatever. In that case, uh, in case of MI as well as that, uh, MI as well as the patient is a patient is uh, if the panel told me is the, your patient is hemorrhage and you unstable, so patient is unable mm -hmm. to take the history. So in that mm -hmm. case, uh, at this when I'm going to transferring the patient to the treatment room, am mm -hmm. I allowed to ask ask any question to the any care carer relatives or any or anyone? Of course, of course. So we are not saying that you need to treat the patient before knowing what you are treating for because that's yeah. impossible. Right? Yeah. So there are always reasonable things for you to do. For example, when would you think the patient has anaphylaxis? So you see a child who has been brought by mother. You lick the you you see the eyes are swollen, lips are swollen, and you feel like the patient is struggling to breathe. Now, in this case, what will you do first? In that case, if it is if I'm confirmed that's I would do first of all adrenaline and then go for the airway airway. I mean airway. In this case, you'll take the patient to the treatment room first, right? And you will ask mother or whoever has brought what happened, right? You will yeah. ask like what happened and you they, maybe they will tell you something and then you will start your treatment at the same time. So generally, yeah. what we need to remember is, now think in this way, it's like, you know, how the multidimensional interaction happens and how the two dimensional um, interactions we have to do in the interview. What I mean to say is, in the interview, I can say things in a particular order only. When I actually do them, I can do multiple things at the same time. But how can I say this to the panel? What we usually say is a lot of these things that we are talking, yes. telling the panel happen simultaneously. Taking history, preparing for the uh, medications, you know, um, examining the patient, giving adrenaline, all these things happen almost simultaneously, side by side. But in the exam, how can I say that simultaneously? I yep. cannot. So I have to go in one particular order. 
And that is yeah. the reason why we were going in that order. So uh, in the beginning, if you want to mention that, I will be doing many of these things simultaneously as practical, but for the sake of this presentation, so I'll be presenting in a particular order. You can say that if you feel like okay. that is going to be something concerning for you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, that applies to all the cases. Let's say that I have a patient with chest pain. I will not give aspirin straight away. Just because yeah. someone says I have chest pain because that could be anything. But if I yeah, see okay. a patient who had chest pain, who looks like he who is sweating, who is leaning forward and looks like he's you know catching his uh, chest, I mean, I see that dramatic presentation. I will perhaps think more about myocardial infarction before thinking of anything else. And so I will transfer the patient to the treatment room. I'll prepare the ECG, which will take only one or two minutes to do. I'll call my supervisor and say that this patient has chest pain. Since it started 30 minutes ago, has been clutching his chest, is diaphoretic, and ECG now is showing there is ST elevation. So when I'm telling my supervisor, my nurse will be preparing for the ECG. And when I'm telling my supervisor, maybe the ECG will be ready. We look at the ECG, we see ST elevation. We ask the patient, have you had any kind of um, heart attacks in the past or not? We ask them if they have any past medical conditions that put them at high risk. And then when we consider all of these factors, we feel like, okay, this could be a possible case of myocardial infarction. We give aspirin. Now you might say that, but what if this is not MI? What if this is not MI? Let's say that the troponin comes out uh, uh, normal and let's say that the specialist looks at the ST, ST elevation and says, this is just non-specific ST elevation. So what happens in that case? You had a reasonable yeah. belief. You, you had a reasonable, you know, um, belief to say that this was a case of myocardial infarction because the, the condition was so okay. typical. So you did what you could. And that is one of the reasons we gave aspirin, but not the other antiplatelet medication, because we know that without being sure, it may not be a good idea to give too many antiplatelet medication. Or, or if I want to give another antiplatelet, I would like to talk to my supervisor and confirming you know, whether it is a confirmed case, of, almost confirmed cases, because of two criteria is enough for diagnosis from myocardial infection. One is the typical chest pain, another mm -hmm. is the ECG without enzyme yes. analysis. So in that case, after consulting with supervisor, can mm -hmm. I give another antiplatelet as well? Or generally, it, generally we don't because we don't keep another one in the community. Okay. Okay. So that's why I say okay. that. Uh, ask your supervisor if you have, um, let's say, the dispiridamol or clopidogrel is available in your clinic or not. Uh, mine does not have. We only have aspirin. We give aspirin, we send to the hospital. Okay. So, so, so my concerning is that at, at this moment, during, during the preparing, the adrenaline preparing, doing the ACC, may I take some history as well as that? During, yes, during the it, it happens simultaneously. It happens simultaneously. You are, you are talking, you are working at the same time. Okay. That's, that's my concern. Okay. Thank you. Because that's um, basically what we need to remember is what we are doing in the interview is what we are actually be doing in the real practice. And when we think in that way, I think everything becomes so simple, so easy. If you think about this, you know, often the concern of people who appear in the exam is what if I can't make the diagnosis? Now think about it and think honestly, how often we can make the diagnosis in just one visit. If you think about it, you know that it's not always we make the diagnosis in just one encounter with the patient, especially mm. in general practice. Especially mm. in general practice, these things go on for some time before you come to a conclusion that the patient has this diagnosis. Unless you have a very you know typical presentation, like, like you have a dermatological condition, you look at the RAS and you know what exactly this is. In all other cases, you first ask the patient to do the investigations. You have a reasonable belief. So you have a provisional diagnosis based on the history. If you think empirical treatment is uh, suitable for the patient, you start the patient on the empirical treatment. Otherwise, if you feel like there is no urgent requirement of the treatment, you will say that we'll wait until the investigation results come and then I'll give you a call and then we'll discuss and based on the results, we'll start the treatment. Generally, this is how things are done in the general practice. Now, you might say then, then why people fail in the exam? Most often, the people fail in the exam because they forget that they are being asked how to how are you going to handle the situation in your practice? They are not being asked, what is the diagnosis? They are not being assessed just for their knowledge. Knowledge is a part of the assessment, but there is clinical skills involved. There is interviewing skills involved. There is um, clinical reasoning involved. So that means, are you at least thinking logically or not? Maybe your diagnosis is not correct, but you are thinking logically, you are doing the right things, then it's okay. 
you don't have to make the diagnosis in such cases. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we move forward? Anything else? Any other confusion? If you don't feel comfortable asking question, you can also write in the chat box. I'm looking at both um, chat box as well as listening to your questions. Anyway, while you are thinking about the questions, let's proceed with one of the typical cases which has been asked in the exam, chest pain case. So in this case, so you have a patient who has come with the chest pain. Now, depending on who, who is your pesky provider, the amount of information you will get will be different. So let's say this case comes in IME, then the information will be, you have a 50-year-old patient coming with a chest pain. How will you approach this case? That's all they will tell you. So a 50-year-old patient with a chest pain, how will, you, how will you approach the case? Or talk to the role player. Generally in IME, it's a mixed um, format exam. There is a role player and there is also a sometimes case discussion. So if there is a role player, they will just give you one liner. Like your patient has this complaint, talk to the patient. If it's RCCP, because they there you have to do the case presentation, they will usually give you a handout. And then in the handout, they will give you the case details. Like there is a patient, he has these details, he has this past history and this, this. A lot of information can be there, not will be, but can be there. And then they will give you the task. Like this, these are your tasks. For example, how would you take the history? Uh, what investigation, what examination do you want to do in this patient? What investigations will you request? And what will be your management plan for this patient? So RCGP usually has this kind of approach in the exam. Whereas in case of IME, they will first give you the case and they will say, talk to the patient. And then after that, how you start the conversation, depending on that, they will keep adding more questions. So they may ask you to do the physical examination after that. And then they may say, like, what investigations would you want to do? And another difference is, when RCGP asks you about the investigations, they usually say, what are the investigations you want to do? IME generally says, what is one investigation you would want to do in this case? So basically, in case of IME, they are asking you, how would you make the diagnosis? What is one investigation that will help you in making the diagnosis? RCGP, what is the investigation that may help you in the diagnosis, as well as what are the other ancillary investigations that you may do in this case? So these are some basic differences between these two providers. So if we get a case like this in the exam, what is the first thing we should do? And how much time do we get after we have been handed over the case? Now, generally they say that, okay, um, if you ask them like, can I can I first think a few minutes? I um, mean, a few seconds, they will say, yeah, it's all right. But generally they expect you to start um, quickly. They don't want you to spend too much time thinking about how to do the case. So that is something for you to keep in mind. Now. Then after that, the next thing is, uh, in cases uh, of uh, in case of RCGP, because they have to allow you to read the case, they will give you some time. But in IME, because you are just given a one-line statement and you need to talk to the patient, generally you have less time to think about what you want to do. In order to do, do well in this exam, you have to make sure that you know about the common differentials of different conditions that come in the exam, especially in cases of the emergencies, so that you don't miss it. And there are various ways you can do this. One way that perhaps is more suitable for the exam is to go to, through the recalls, to look at the recalls, to see what have been the common presentations and what have been the diagnosis for those possible presentation. As an example, what have been the cases of chest pain in the exam so far? So chest pain has been a case of pulmonary embolism, chest pain has been a case of pneumonia, chest pain has been a case of myocardial infarction, has been a case of um, this angina. So this way you will get an idea about what are the questions I should not miss because these cases have already been asked. And there is a tendency of repetition of these cases as well. So um, thinking about what have been the cases in the past for this presentation will help you to have a better approach. That is one way. The other way is like being more comprehensive in your preparation. It will require more time, but eventually it will be more uh, rewarding in the future as you will be learning about a lot of things. One of the resources you can use for differential diagnosis is John Murtag. So John Murtag has common presentations in general practice. The first few chapters, I think there are 30 conditions mentioned there. Just have a look at those conditions. If you have time, you can read as well. Otherwise, you can simply look at the differential diagnosis given there because John Murtag generally has common conditions that we see in general practice in Australia. So that is one of the ways you can prepare the general, um, the differential diagnosis list. 
In this case, for example, if I have a patient with chest pain, I would first approach in this way. This is based on John Murtagh's approach, by the way. Life-threatening conditions and non-life-threatening conditions. The things that I should not miss and the things which are more likely to happen in the general practice. We need to consider both of them. And the rest, even if we miss, doesn't matter much. So I should not miss what is common. I should not miss what is life-threatening. So what are the life-threatening conditions? So in the mediastinum, it could be an esophageal rupture. It could be great vessels like dissecting aneurysm or pulmonary embolism. In the heart, it could be because of myocardial infarction, and it could be acute pericarditis. In the respiratory, it could be pneumothorax, could be pneumonia, could be pleuritis, and it could be malignancies. These are some of the life-threatening conditions. Non-life-threatening conditions could be just the functional pain, such as because of anxiety, because of hyperventilation syndrome, could be spinal dysfunction, such as cervical dysfunction and thoracic dysfunction, could be because of chest wall conditions, such as trauma or costochondritis. So these are some of the conditions to keep in mind. Or sometimes even herpes gesture can also present in this manner. Or esophagitis, acid reflux, peptic ulcer disease, esophageal spasm. These are some of the conditions to keep in mind. So if you see a case of chest pain, how would you start the case? And what are the complications that they give you in the exam? One of the common complication is this. Ambulance takes half an hour to reach. What do you do? This is actually the RCGP question. This is a very common question in RCGP as well as ACRAM. I don't know much about ACRAM because I am not that much familiar with their format and I know that not that many people are preparing for ACRAM these days. Is they have a dismal passing rate. So how do you start the case? First is, of course, you have to ask the question, like, is my patient stable? Because you have to know if this is an emergency that you have to approach in a different way, or this is just a routine case. Generally, when you ask, if, is my patient stable? You might get one of the two possible responses. They might say, yes, your patient is stable. If they want to be a bit nasty, what they'll say is, what do you want to know? So that means simply they're asking, uh, they're asking you to tell them about uh, the vitals. Like I want to know their blood pressure, their heart rate, their uh, respiratory rate, their temperature, their oxygen saturation, their capillary refill time. If you say some, some of the panels ask, want you to ask specific questions, whereas the others will simply tell you the patient is stable. If the patient is not stable, you will have to activate DRSABCD, which we have just discussed. Anytime they tell you that the patient is not stable, then you have to activate DRSABCD. And in DRSABCD, in addition to what we discussed earlier, try to incorporate a few relevant points for your presenting complaint in the exam. As an example, let's say that we are talking about circulation in a patient who is presenting with the chest pain. It might be relevant for you to include radio radial and radio femoral delay to exclude thoracic aorta dissection or abdominal aorta dissection. And then you might say that I want to check the JPP at the same time when I'm doing this. So this way, what happens is not only you are doing the airway breathing circulation, you are also integrating the possible positive findings of the patient as well. And that makes it sound more relevant. And then um, in this case, you might ask, you might do the abdominal examination why you want to do the abdominal examination is there have been cases of abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, with atrial fibrillation in the past, which uh, in which the patient had uh, the presentation of the chest pain as well as patient had the uh, pulsatile mass in the abdomen. So you can think about this as well. Generally, at this stage, you may say that, and then I will ask the patient, I will ask the practice nurse to prepare a 12 lead ECG, and then in your exam, they will show you the ECG or they will give you the ECG. And then you have to be able to interpret the ECG as well. They expect you to interpret certain ECGs in the exam, in general, this basic exam. For example, they want you to know about how a myocardial infarction looks like. They want you to know how, how hyperkalemia looks like. They want you to know how pulmonary embolism case looks like. So make sure that you are familiar with these typical ECGs for the exam. So if the patient is stable, then your approach will be different. Now, unstable patient, you do that DRSABCD, you stabilize the patient, you give the patient the preliminary treatment that we discussed earlier, and then you prepare for the transfer. And in the transfer part, uh, we did not discuss that, but I may have discussed this in other cases, that generally when we are transferring the patient, we do something called ISOBAR approach. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. ISOBAR simply means you introduce yourself, you 
talk about the situation of the patient, like what the patient has presented with, like you may say that the patient has presented with chest pain and so on. Then you talk about the observation, which means what did you find in the examination? And B is for background. That usually means the patient's past medical history, medicine history, surgical history, and psychosocial history, which you find relevant to the presenting complaint. Your assessment, that means what do you think the patient has? Generally here, we talk about the provisional diagnosis and differential diagnosis, and then recommendation. What do you think the patient needs? Why are you sending the patient to the hospital? What are you expecting the hospital to do? So if you have this much information in your transfer, usually it is considered a well-structured transfer document. And even in your real practice, when you have this information, this will be quite helpful. So just a while ago, for example, I had a patient, I mean, this morning, for example, I had a patient who had strangulated hernia. So this person came with uh, this nine, uh, 82, 82 or 83 year old gentleman came to my clinic saying that he has a lump. And then the lump is becoming quite painful. So when I asked like when the pain started, he said that the pain was there for about a week, but from this morning, it is becoming really bad. So um, here I could have, you know, gone through all the questions of Socrates asking past medical history and this and that. But when he said lump in general practice, this is how situation changes. He tell, told me he had a lump. He said that the lump has become more painful from this morning. Thing that came to my mind was hernia that may have become strangulated. So I asked him to lie on the bed first. And then I checked there was a lump. I asked him, did, did this lump comes and uh, goes or did you try to push it back? He said that, no, it's very painful. I touched it, it was very painful. Now, practically what happens? So I, at this stage, now I have to make a decision. Am I going to do anything about this patient? Should I send this patient to the hospital? Or should I just do something in the general practice? Before I answer this question, I want to know your opinion. What would you do if you get a patient like this? in your clinic, what would be your next step? Maybe someone can volunteer and tell me. You mean this is a case of uh, irreducible hernia? Yeah, you have just you just have a, a patient who you think has irreducible hernia. You have not even taken a proper history, but you just have seen that the patient has a lump, which uh, you cannot reduce, has exquisite pain from this morning, and uh, now you need to make a decision what you want to do. Might be he can transfer to the hospital to surgeons to have a look on it. Yes. Now, this is a situation you'll be presented with almost every day in general practice. I'm not talking about hernia. I'm talking about this dilemma. Can I manage this patient here in the clinic or should I send this patient to the hospital? Is this a real emergency or this is just I'm feeling more apprehensive? Now, we have to be honest about the situation here. Sometimes what happens is sometimes we look at the patient, we feel confused. What am I dealing with? Do I even know what is happening here? And we see a patient who is very worried, might be in a lot of pain. And generally our response to that is, okay, I don't know what is going on here. Let's send the patient to the hospital, which is not appropriate. You need to take some reasonable steps first. You have to think about, is there anything that I can do here? Anything that could be pain relief, that could be some investigations or anything. So in my case, what I did was first, first of all, what we need to know is general practitioners are there to reduce the workload on the hospital so that the hospital emergency especially can focus on those patients which, who require immediate attention. And when we are sending the patients who do not require immediate attention to the hospital emergencies, that takes, the, that takes away the opportunity for the other patient who requires that. And hospital treatment, usually, the research in Australia has shown that hospital treatment is much more expensive than general practice treatment. So as a general practice now, if you think about what your responsibility is, a lot of answers become very, uh, you know, uh, you, you, a lot of answers will start making more sense to you why we are doing that and why we are why we should do that. As an example, in this case, first I thought, is there anything that I can do? First is I had to be sure if this is actually hernia or something else. So what I did, I did a little bit of examination. I did those cough test, impulse test, and whatever. But we all know that they are not sensitive in specific. Then after that, <clears throat> I listened to the ball sound. I tried to listen for the ball sound. I could not hear anything. Now, the patient is complaining of exquisite pain, but I cannot hear any ball sound. And so it could be, um, now it could be the strangulated hernia. So first thing I did was I called the, uh, the radiology which is just beside my clinic, I asked them, if I send you a patient for urgent CT scan, would you be able to do anything? 
because I know that if I send the patient to the hospital, most likely that will be another thing they will consider. So I asked the radiology, can you do it right now and give me the result immediately, at least the preliminary result. They said that, no, we, uh, you may need to wait for another two and a half hours. So that gave me the sense that this patient, for this patient, it is better to go to the hospital rather than wait here for another two hours just to do the CT scan. So I sent the patient. Now you might be wondering, why didn't you straight away send the patient? I was trying to see if there is anything I could do the, for the patient before sending the patient. That was the only reason for that. I wanted to be sure that the patient needs to go to the hospital. Now comes the question, but what if I get the same question in the exam? Should I say that I would want to do the CT scan and find out what the patient has? I would say for the exam, don't do that. For the exam, it is better to say that, send the patient to the hospital for the emergency management because you are suspecting a strangulated hernia. So what I'm trying to say here is there are a lot of things that we do practically and many of those things we can say in the exam as well, but there are certain things which we which will be better not to say, which will be better not to say just for the obvious reason that in the exams, there are certain answers they are expecting from you. For example, the one like this. Anyway, coming back to the case we are discussing here. So in this case, patient is stable. What will you do now? You will start taking the history of the pain by using the Socrates. I'm not going to the details of Socrates because I have discussed this many, many times in many of my videos in the past as well. So ask the questions about Socrates, ask the question about the red flags. So red flag questions will be the diagnosis, um, differential diagnosis questions of the life-threatening conditions. As an example, if we go back to our differential diagnosis list here and look at some of these conditions. Now, when you're practicing, what you can do is look at the differentials and think yourself, what question would I ask to know about this condition? So if I want to know about, let's say, pulmonary embolism, what question should I be asking the patient? Or if I think um, that this is acute pericarditis, what question do I need to ask the patient about it? So condition-specific screening questions are very important in the exam for interviewing skills. And for every question, there are typical questions that, uh, for I mean, for every condition, there are typical questions we can ask. As an example, for a patient with acute pericarditis, they will, if you ask like, do you, does your pain get better when you lean forward? And usually the answer will be yes, because there will be less stretching of the pericardium. When they do that, pericardium will be more supported. And just like that, there are other conditions, esophageal rupture, for example. Did you have any, um, you know, forceful vomiting recently? Or uh, in case of pneumothorax, you may say that is your pain positional or does it is it related to the breathing? So that will give you the idea and so on. So just like this, for every possible differential, you should have one, at least one screening question. You can have more than one, but generally one is enough for the exam. So quickly you'll ask questions about the uh, red flags in DD and then any previous or uh, similar attack. Uh, then past medical histories, any known medical conditions like any heart or lung disease, any pelvic, uh, sorry, uh, peptic ulcer disease, any mental health issues, any recent surgeries. And you can see that in the past medical history, why am I asking any questions questions about any heart or lung disease? To know about the, uh, the risk factors. Peptic ulcer disease, why? Because of the similar kind of presentation sometimes. Mental health issues, because I have anxiety disorders, hyperventilation syndrome in the um, um in my list of differentials, any recent surgery, because I'm suspecting pulmonary embolism as one of the causes as well. So the relevant questions in appropriate section. Medication, if the patient is on any medication. Uh, here, when you're asking medication questions, you need to ask if the patient is on any prescription medication or over-the-counter medication. During your practice, you'll come across many patients who will tell you that, uh, are you taking any medicine? They will say no. And then when you ask, are you taking any herbal medicine? And they will say yes. So this is another reason why you have to be specific here. Are you taking any prescribed medication or over-the-counter medication, including any herbal medication? And then you will cover everything possible. And it's quite interesting that um, often you will get different types of patients who will answer to only specific kind of questions you will ask. You know, uh, for example, smoking question. When you ask it, I think just yesterday, I asked one of my patients, do you smoke? He said, no. Now, now after this, what are what as a doctor I should assume? That means the patient has is a non-smoker. But then I, I persisted and I asked, have you ever smoked? And he said, yeah, yeah, a long time ago. And I asked, when was that long time ago? And he said, I stopped smoking two weeks ago. 
so I don't know it was because of, you know, the patients sometimes feel a bit embarrassed to say these things or because of some other reasons. They sometimes do not say what you need to hear. So two weeks is not a long time. Maybe for that patient, it is a long time. But for you, you know that it's not a long time. Uh, even for alcohol, you will get similar kind of history. Do you drink alcohol? No. And if you ask them, when was the last time you drank? Maybe one week ago. So it's very common. So that's why if you want to be sure the patient is non-drinker, non-smoker, especially if they have positive answers, fine. If the answers to smoking and alcohol are negative, also ask, have you ever tried? Negative answer, always ask. And in the exam, you'll be surprised. When you ask this question, they will tell you, yes, I quitted. Some will say maybe one month ago. Some will say maybe three years ago. Some will say maybe 40 years ago. But you have to follow that up with those questions. And so psychosocial history, uh, we have sad matured. And again, we have discussed sad matured multiple times in the past. Those of you who do not know what it is, please watch my video about history taking, which I have uploaded on YouTube. Uh, what is sad matured and what kind of questions you need to ask here. Now, if you go back to the, um, the, the structure here, you can see that this is what we call a structured interviewing. And if you can do this IME exam, almost always you'll pass. If you can take a good history, in a structured manner, regardless of what positive you get and whether or not you make the diagnosis, if your history taking is good, almost always you'll pass the exam unless you make a blunder. If you make a blunder, of course, then you will have problems. But otherwise, if you make a habit of asking history taking in Socrates, red flags, DDs, followed by past medical history, medicine history, then any psychosocial history, family history. If you do in this manner, in all the cases, you'll never have problem. And usually you'll get positive findings in relevant places. Then office test. Once you have mentioned all the history taking questions, you can go for the office test. Now, uh, sometimes people ask me, should I do the office test after the examination? Should I do it before the investigation? Should I do it before the examination? What should I do? Generally, you should do it after the examination. But in the examination, uh, in your PESCI, if they have, don't, they have not given you the task for examination, so they have only asked you to do the history taking. And then after that, if they ask you, what investigations would you want to do? In this case, don't start with the investigations straight away. In such cases, if they, you have not been asked to do the examination, first mention the office test that I want to do this test and then I want to do these investigations. Reason is quite obvious because office tests sometimes can give you a clue about what you should be expecting from further lab test or radiological test. So that's something for you to keep in mind. Now, investigations in case of someone who has presented with chest pain, these are the investigations, but the question is, should general practitioners be doing this, this test or not? So I have a patient who had chest pain and I'm suspecting that could be myocardial infarction. Should I be ordering the troponin and wait for the result? Or should I send, send the patient to the hospital? Or let me ask you this question in a different way. In what condition should I be doing troponin in the general practice? Do I have any indication for that? Is there any situation where I might do troponin in the clinic? And what precaution will you take when you are ordering troponin? That is another follow-up question that you might get in the exam. Anyone? Anyone want to I try? If, if I suspect it is a cardiac case MI, it is better not to do it in the uh, in my clinic. Uh, yes. Because it will, uh, to save time to send the patient to the mm. emergency. But if it is if non-cardiac uh, cause of, of uh, I did not suspect if, uh, it is not MI, uh, I can do it uh, uh, and as no matter uh, uh, what time it takes, it, it will mm. it will never delay the referral of the patient. Yes. So troponin, we don't do troponin in the general practice to rule in. We don't do it to rule in. We don't do it to make the diagnosis. We actually make do it to rule out. Only do it if you have very low suspicion of myocardial infarction to rule out the possibility. Then next important thing is, okay, you want to rule out. What is the precaution we, would you take then? A few options you have here. If you think that the patient maybe has a low, even a low risk of heart um, myocardial infarction, ask the patient to stay in the clinic for observation while you're sending the troponin. Or if you are really assured that the patient 
uh, you can send the patient home because you are not that much worried. Then in that case, always check the patient's contact details. Always check if the you if you have the current contact details of the patient or not. Now I'll tell you one real story that happened in Australia a while ago and which led to a medical legal case. So what happened was there was a general practitioner who had a patient who came with chest pain, but it was not a typical chest pain, typical myocardial infarction chest pain. A typical chest pain, patient was stable, fine, talking to the doctor, no typical symptoms of uh, cardi uh, myocardial infarction. A few mistakes that the GPs made, that, that the, the GP made. First, GP did not do ECG because he did not think that it could be myocardial infarction because the patient looked quite stable and fine. And there was no reason for him to believe the patient had uh, myocardial infarction. Second, the GP did a troponin test anyway and then send the patient home. Now, what happened? So the clinic got closed at 5, 5.30, whatever time it was. They all went home and then GP received a call from the lab. Usually if the troponin comes out positive, the lab will call and let, because it's an emergency test. So the lab will usually call the requesting doctor and let them know that troponin is positive. If it's hospital, then they, you just call the ward from which you got the, the request. If it is a non-hospital setting, then in that case, you will just call the doctor who requested the test. So the lab called the doctor, told the doctor that the troponin is positive and then doctor this suddenly, you know, this suddenly becomes a scary situation. So what the doctor did, doctor looked at the, uh, the the practice software to find out the patient details and called the patient. And that was the contact details were not updated. So those contact details were not correct. Now is the problem. So we have a patient who probably has myocardial infarction. Maybe it's false positive troponin or maybe it's troponin positive for other conditions because troponin can be positive in other situations as well. But you have a potential case of myocardial infarction, but you cannot get to the patient. So this was a situation that happened a while ago. So how can you avoid a situation like this in the real practice is if you are considering troponin, first make sure that the patient, even if there is a small risk, send the patient to the hospital. It's better to do that. Although theoretically you can do troponin, you can um, you can send the patient home. If your plan is to do that, make sure that you can reach the patient, make sure the contact details are Correct. So that if they, you find you get the result positive, you can call the patient and send the patient to the hospital. So sometimes, yes, in general practice also, we do troponin, we do D-dimer, some of these tests which we consider critical tests based on the results of which we may need to send the patient to the hospital. But if you are doing any of those time critical tests, then you have to make sure that the contact details are correct and you know how to uh, you know how to contact the patient and how to send the patient to the hospital so in the case of the patient that i was talking about earlier actually the general practitioner had to call the police and the police contacted the patient generally that's what happens if you are not unable to reach the patient who has probably uh, a, a time critical result as an example a patient with a warfarin result a inr result of 10 who has been taking warfarin and you cannot reach the patient. So what are you going to do? Your only option left now is to call the police uh, who will trace the patient, find the patient and send the patient to the hospital. So anyway, so in case of the myocardial infarction, if they ask you what investigations do you want to do, talk about the office test rather than the actual test. And then they will ask you what investigations will they do in the hospital or what will happen in the hospital and be ready to answer that question as well. You need to know how they manage myocardial infarction in the hospital. And you don't need to go into the details of the um, the exact medications, their doses, and how they are started, but you need to have a basic understanding. And in myocardial infarction, another common question is they will ask you like, what medication the patients are put in after they are discharged from the hospital? So you need to know what medications generally are patients um, started on before they are discharged, because those are the medications that the general practitioners have to manage. So basically in emergency cases, what you need to do, you need to remember is what you need to do in the clinic before sending the patient to the hospital. And once the patient comes back from the hospital, what medications generally they are kept on by the specialist in the hospital. So these two things you have to know. And then after that, you have to know what is your responsibility now. Most often, the responsibility of the general practitioners after this is coordination of care. So I will not go into the details of what kind of medication you'll be giving to this patient. What we will look at is what happens in the hospital. Generally in the hospital, what happens is they are first hooked to the monitor. They are their stability checked continuously and some investigations, some blood is taken and sent for in some investigations, which includes troponin. That is the most important one you have to mention. 
And um, by the way, should we do CKMB or not? So does the hospital do CKMB? Most of the hospitals in Australia do not do this. They only do troponin I or troponin T, depending on what they have available in their um, hospital lab. So they will just do that. CKMB usually is not done. Um, treatment in the acute phase, medications, um, you keep um, aspirin, you keep another antiplatelet agent based on your hospital protocol then beta blocker, statins, and low, low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. This is usually the treatment in the acute phase. Your, for you, the most important part is this. What does the patient get before they are discharged from the hospital? Because these are the ones that you will have to optimize. Generally, most of these patients get combination therapy which is a two platelet antiplatelet agent where they will also specify how long they need to the patient needs to take it. Uh, they are also put on statins and beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Oral anticoagulants are used only if they have found any indication for that. You don't even need to memorize what indications, whatever indications I have written there. The common ones are just the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, statins, and aspirin. So these are the ones you will have to remember for the um, for the exam if they ask you like what medication the patient is put on. So what will you do for this patient? That will be the next question of the panel. So as I told you in the beginning of our discussion, you first have to check the discharge letter and any prescribed medications. Now these days in most of the clinics, you can access the discharge letter from your practice software. So maybe if you are already going for observation, you can ask your supervisor to show you how to how the discharge letter is checked. So generally, uh, Australia has health record, electronic health record, and if the patient has given consent to share that electronic health record, you can just access the electronic health record where you will see most of the relevant information, including the discharge letter. So you can get the discharge letter from there. Sometimes they bring the printout, so you have to read that. And there, what other things you need to find out? how long the patient was in hospital, what treatment was given, what is the diagnosis of the patient, if diagnosis was made, and what treatment the patient has been put on and what they are expecting you to do. So these are the things that you'll have to check in the discharge letter. And then after that, um, but in the exam, you'll only mention that I'll check the discharge letter for these things, which I just mentioned. Then after that, you'll have to speak with the patient where you need to find out if the patient has any acute problem right now like any abdominal or chest pain, any shortness of breath, any palpitations, any dizziness, headache. So anything that you find relevant in your case, you can ask about that. And if last time, if in your exam, in the history taking part, before you reach the sample history taking part, if you remember what sample is, we discussed a while ago, before you asked any questions about sample or before you were able to take the full history, if you had to send the patient to the hospital, then in that case, you would want to complete your history now so that you can complete the patient's medical record so that you have all information about all the medication patient takes, all the psychosocial factors which can have impact on the patient's well-being. So you would want to know all of those things. And then you can do a quick physical examination. One important thing for physical examination here is, and I have emphasized this multiple times in my basic course, that no matter what case you get, always start with the general appearance and vital signs. Many people have failed in the past because of this general appearance and vital signs. And this has been explicitly mentioned in the feedback of many candidates that the candidate did not start by assessing the general condition of the patient and vital signs. They expect you to at least check these things in general practice, how the patient looks like and whether you have taken the vitals or not. Even in the vitals, you, you can say that, for example, a patient who you suspect has sepsis, you can simply say that I would be checking the vitals, but I would be mostly concerned about the patient's blood pressure and temperature. If you say this, that's fine. But always mention that I'll check the general appearance and I'll take the patient's vital. And you have to document all of these things in the patient's file. Now, in addition to all these things, if it's a medical, um, if it's a myocardial infarction case, there are some additional things to consider as well. For example, driving. In case of myocardial infarction, there is restriction in place about how long they cannot drive. Generally, they are not allowed to drive for at least two weeks. And if they are driving the commercial vehicles, then they are not allowed to drive for at least four weeks. And it is the responsibility of the patient to notify the 
DLA or driving licensing authority. In different states, they have different names, but they have to notify their driving licensing authority for that restriction they have on their license. So uh, you might, if uh, what I want you to understand from this is I'm talking about myocardial infarction, but maybe your case in the exam will be abdominal aortic aneurysm. Maybe your case in the exam will be diabetic ketoacidosis. Maybe your case in the exam will be pulmonary embolism. It can be anything, any other emergencies. What I'm trying to say here is think about the approach, not about the exact information I'm giving you here. Like how would you approach an emergency case in the exam? And that usually means first stability. Then if they say that, no, generally what they do is generally they, if they want to ask you about, uh, if they want to ask you about, uh, let's say, uh, how to manage a, uh, an emergency case, they will tell you that the patient is not, a patient is, uh, not stable, but in most of the cases, even if the patient is unstable, they will just say, okay, your patient is stable. The reason for that is because they want to hear how you would take the history. And then later on, after finishing the history and doing the examination, they will tell you some emergency condition. So, and that sometimes confuses some people that, but they told me that the patient was stable and that's okay, doesn't, that doesn't matter. If at the end the diagnosis is an emergency condition, you still have to take that as a case of emergency, which means you you now will consider transferring the patient to the treatment room, you will start monitoring the patient, you'll prepare for the transfer and while waiting for the transfer, uh, transfer to arrive, you'll keep an eye on the patient, but this time you have already taken history and you have already you, know, you already uh, know about the patient, so you will not be doing some of the things that you had to do in the cases where the patient had um, patient was unstable to start with. So otherwise, the everything else will be similar. So anyway, so um, coming back to the discussion here. So in any any cases of emergency which comes back from the hospital, first part of your management management will be optimizing their medicine, whatever they have been put on. The second part will be look, thinking about the other. Um, other lifestyle related issues where there you may need to talk about the their food, their exercise, and you also need to talk about any kind of restrictions they have in place for driving, for example, because of their condition. Driving is one of the important condition to consider in all these cases, how long they should not be driving because of their condition. Then the other thing you need to think about is, okay, in addition to the medicine and the lifestyle changes, do I need to send this patient to anyone else? For example, do I need to send this patient to a psychologist? Should I send this patient to a physiotherapist? Should I send this patient to the exercise physiologist? The, does this patient require occupational therapist? So you need to consider that as well. So basically in the management part, you have to think in this way. So when you reach the management of these patients, you have to think about, let's say pharmacological. Now, when I say pharmacological, depending on the cases, it could be pharmacological or surgical management. So generally, you think about pharmacological management, you think about lifestyle management, and you think about ancillary services, which means what are the support system available for this patient? So as an example, in case of someone who has come back from heart attack uh, or myocardial infarction, you might think about cardiac rehabilitation clinic. So these are the clinics where they will teach the patient graduated exercise, how to gradually return to their daily activities of living. So you might consider doing that. that. Or let's say that a patient has come back after heart failure, then you will think about cardiac rehabilitation, you will think about the heart failure nursing, so those kind of things. So you need to consider those things as well. If they ask you, how will you manage this patient, don't jump into the, um, the medication only. Say that in the management of this patient, I'll think the pharmacological, non-pharmacological, and ancillary support. If you think and if you start presenting in this way, then this will be more uh, impressive and comprehensive as well. Okay, the other thing is in general practice, whenever we have a patient with chronic conditions, when we say chronic conditions in general practice, we are thinking about conditions which are going to last for more than six months at least. In such cases, we have a special thing that we do for these patients in general practice, and they want to hear that word from you. That is general practice management plan, a GP management plan. So basically, GP management plan is nothing but a structured way for general practitioners to help the patient where they set the targets. So something like, okay, a patient has come back after heart failure uh, to the general practitioner and we are preparing the general practice management plan here. So what are we going to do? We are going to write things like in three months, 
this is the weight we I want the patient um, to have. Uh, we'll try to bring down the blood pressure to this level. We'll try to um, reduce the medications. Let's say that multiple medication will try to reduce to this. We'll try to improve the functional level of the patient to this. At least we expect the patient to be able to walk this much and so on. So you set, set the targets in a structured manner in a document. And that's what we call GPMB. And TCA is team care arrangement. And generally to achieve this, you may need support from others as well. So you may need to improve the well-being of the patients or mental health of the patient. So you will not be able to do it all by yourself. You might need help of a counts, uh, psychologist. So that is one of the health professionals involved in the care of the patient. Then you think that the patient requires the cardiac rehabilitation as well. So they need require they need help from the uh, the nursing support available in the cardiac rehabilitation clinic. So that is the second person. You as a general practitioner, third person. So there are now three people involved in the care of the patient. Anytime you think that three or more than three people are going to be involved in the care of the patient, which are who are health professionals, you activate team care arrangement. And generally when someone is in team care arrangement, they get subsidized visit to these providers. When they go to the count, uh, the psychologist, when they go to the physiotherapist, then they are covered by the Medicare. So Medicare will provide some rebate. And if they are bulk billed, they will not have to pay anything. So that is the reason why in these cases, never forget to mention GPMP and TCA, because almost always, you, always you'll be talking about physiotherapist, exercise physiologist, dietitian, psychologist, an occupational therapist, a lot of these people. If you don't have TCA and patient goes to these people, they will have out-of-pocket expenses. So they will miss the opportunity to get the Medicare rebate. And so you have to include this. With the consent of the patient and after discussing with my supervisor, I would like to activate the GP management plan and team care arrangement for this patient. That's the only thing you need to say. And that's the only thing they want to hear from you. At least that to check that or to know that you know about these things. Now, the other thing they will uh, perhaps assess you about is reminder and recall system. Some of these patients have to be in a regular follow-up program. Some of these follow-ups are just the routine follow-ups and some of these follow-ups are really important follow-ups. Let's say that you have done a test for the patient. Let's say that you check the sodium level of the patient and the, and the sodium has come out as 120. Now, in this case, how urgent do you think for the patient is to come back to you or to go to the um, go to the hospital? But, but because we are talking about general practice, let's say that how important it is for the patient to come back to you. Anyone? Does anyone know how important it is for the patient to come back to you if they have sodium level of 120? Or let's say that you did the biopsy of a patient. There was a lesion on the forehead of a patient. You did the biopsy and the result has come back as, let's say, melanoma. How important it is for you to see this patient now? Any idea? This thing has medical legal importance, so you have to know this. If no one is willing to answer, let me tell you. Melanoma, if I miss this patient, or if this patient misses what I need to tell him or her, there are fatal consequences, grave consequences. So here, I have to recall the patient. This is called recall, where it is required by law for me to uh, inform the patient. That is called a recall. Recall are required by the law. If I don't do it, then I am liable. So I can be um, you know, sued in the court and I may have to pay the damages or there are grave consequences for me as well. Reminder, a patient who has a total cholesterol of six, I want to see this patient because I want to discuss about the lifestyle choices as well as I want to discuss if the patient is interested in starting the uh, medication. So this is a reminder. Because here, if the patient does not come back, then there are some health impact, but this is not going to be too grave. So the patient is not going to die or there are not permanent disfigurement to the patient. That's why this is a reminder. So recall and reminder, these are two things you have to keep in mind. There are certain conditions where you activate the recall system. There are certain conditions where you just put a reminder. 
And depending on your results, you will have to think about this as well. All right, we'll not go into this and uh, not this as well. So basically to summarize what we have discussed here was the case of myocardial infarction, someone who came with chest pain. How we approach the case, we start with the stability. If the patient panel had told us that the patient was unstable, we'd go in DRS ABCD pathway. If the patient says, if the panel says the patient is stable, then we'll simply go in the normal pathway. We will ask the questions about the patient's presenting complaint, followed by red flags, differential diagnosis, then past medical history, medicine history, psychosocial history, and family history. And then physical examination if they ask us. Otherwise, we'll do the office test. After the office test, we go to the investigations. And after the investigations, depending on what diagnosis we uh, get or what diagnosis they share with us, we decide if the patient goes to the hospital or, or the management can continue in the community. If the patient goes to the hospital and comes back to us after being discharged, our job is to look at the discharge letter, find out some relevant information which we have discussed earlier, take a brief history from the patient, and then after that, prepare uh, optimal care for the patient, which may involve including other health professionals as well. And in that case, we'll also in, think about GPMP and TCA in addition to everything else we'll do for the patient. Generally speaking, management plan will be pharmacological, non-pharmacological, and ancillary services. In non-pharmacological management, along with uh, uh, the lifestyle choices, we also need to think about the medical legal consequences of patient's condition, especially about driving. So this is a brief and broad overview of how to approach emergency cases. Now we can do a little bit of discussion, and uh, if anyone has any question, about PESKI or about emergency cases in general practice and how to approach them, or any specific case in mind, we can discuss those cases now. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. Doctor, Hello, doctor. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. May I talk? Yes, of course. Uh, in exam preparation, there's a routine way that when a patient comes with pain, we ask mm -hmm. the stability. After confirming patient stable, then we ask mm -hmm. in a scale pain scale how severe your pain, and mm -hmm. then we uh, offer some painkillers. So how okay. does it applicable to the this chest pain? Because simple paracetamol won't relieve the pain, and mm -hmm. unless uh, we are confirming it's a uh, in my, we can't give morphine. So mm -hmm. how the painkillers applicable here? So, you know, this this um, this trend of giving painkiller to the patient became more popular with the AMC clinical exam, where we always thought that it was the most important thing to do. Yes, it's the most human thing to do, rather than the most clinically most important thing to do. You don't want to put the patient in pain. Uh, but in some cases like this, it's more important for you to know what is going to happen to the patient because we want to know what is going to kill the patient here. Now, regarding your question, uh, is it important for me to take care of the pain of the patient? Yes. If I think that uh, if I generally in general practice, if someone tells me that I have pain, I would not say take this Panadol because I don't even have them in my clinic. If I feel like the patient really has bad pain that requires immediate treatment, then I would transfer the patient to the treatment room and there I would start giving the patient the pain medications. But before I do that, I have to first be convinced that patient has some emergencies. And the other thing, practical thing to consider here is if the patient has been able to bear the pain, to wait in the waiting room and to come to me in the general practice, I don't think another two minutes or five minutes is going to make any big difference because this is not an emergency room where I'm doing the consultation. Yeah, I just ask in exam setup. Uh, how in the exam you... setup also, uh, I don't think it will make a big okay. difference because okay. once you make the diagnosis, you can always transfer the patient to the treatment room and you can start your treatment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Emergency rooms are different because in emergency rooms, you have got your uh, those um, uh, resist trays and you have got access to the medicine. So if someone is in pain, you can immediately give the pain. In fact, even before you review the patient, the nurses may have reviewed the patient and given them painkillers. So hospital settings, it happens in a slightly different way. In general practice, usually the patient is waiting outside. We call them in, in their turn unless we have any reasonable belief to think that the patient requires immediate attention. 
Uh, and then we call them, we ask them questions, and then when we feel like they might feel really be in very bad pain, then we could tell them that you have to take this painkiller. Because in my clinic, for example, I'm just telling you the practical thing. Uh, so you know that gout is painful. You know that you, uh, the renal stone is painful. Both of them can be really painful. So I had a patient with the renal stone. I assessed the patient. I came to know that it is most likely renal stone. So what I did was I sent the patient to the hospital. Now, you might be wondering, but did you give the painkiller? No. I just sent the patient to the hospital. Why? Because that was the most practical thing for me to do there. I didn't even have any painkillers there to offer to the patient, any strong painkillers. And the patient already had taken Panadol. So what was the point of giving that to the patient, which they had already taken? Most often when they come to the general practice, they will tell you that they have taken Panadol or they have taken Neurofen. So there is not much for you to offer to the patient because any stronger painkillers you don't keep in the clinic anyway. Okay, thank you. Dr. Roman, please, does it make any difference if the patient was uh, ATSI? Um, I mean, yes. should I ask? Yeah. Yes. Uh, RCCP and other uh, colleges, for example, ACRAM and even APRA, wants us to assess whether the patient is ATSI or not. So um, there was always this confusion. Should I ask the patient whether they are ATSI or not in the beginning? And uh, I have come to this conclusion that if you are not, if you have not been told, it's better to ask if the patient is ATSI or not. Now you might be wondering, how does that change anything? There are a few things that change. Being ATSI changes the risk factors because there are certain conditions, especially chronic health conditions and infectious conditions are more common in ATSI population. Second, the support they get is different. For example, for ATSI patient management in Australia, there is an initiative called Closing the Gap. Under this initiative, what happens is, let's say that in generally, I, I'm not sure how many of you know about PBS. Do you know about PBS, Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme? Yeah, something to reduce the cost for more for the average. Yes. Yeah. Um, PBS is for everyone. If you are on Medicare, there are certain medicines which have been subsidized by the government. So there is something called private prescription and PBS prescription. Private prescription means you pay all out of pocket. There is no subsidies. So if the medicine costs $40, you pay $40. Then after that, um, let's say that the patient is on, uh, let's say the medicine is on PBS. So that $40 medicine, maybe because of the government subsidies becomes $10. Now, the patient can buy the private prescription, patient can buy the PBS prescription as well. You might be wondering, so if I can get the same medicine for $10, why will I be buying the same medicine for $40 then? PBS medications can only be prescribed if the patient meets certain criteria. And those criteria are usually listed. You don't need to memorize those criteria. The, the dispensing software that you'll be using has those criteria listed there. So for ex as an example, let's say that you have a patient who you think needs esomeprazole. Now you want to give, let's say 40 esomeprazole to this patient. Now, if you try to give this patient 40 esomeprazole at the private uh, prescription price, you can simply prescribe, no problem. The same esomeprazole, 40 tablets, might cost only around $6 in PBS and $40 in the full price. So you want to prescribe the $6 one to the patient to, under PBS, then PBS will ask, is this patient eligible for this? And then you have to write the indication when you are why you are doing this. And then if if the 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 medication is under a particular list, what the software will say is okay. In that case, get the approval. So I think this is beyond the scope of this discussion. And these are the things you will learn once you start working. But generally, what this means is now before you prescribe this medicine at this subsidized price under the government scheme, you have to get the approval from the government. Generally, that can be done online or by calling the service. So you call them, you tell them about the patient, you tell them why you are prescribing that medication, and then they say, okay, it is approved. They give you a number, you put that number, and then the same $40 medicine now becomes $6 medicine. So this is called PBS, Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, under which some eligible patients can buy the medication at the reduced price. So this is PBS. Now, there is another thing called closing the gap. So in PBS, sometimes what happens is there is something called shared payment. Shared payment means at least they are still paying $6. It's not completely free. Now, in closing the gap, what happens is the government gives 
additional subsidies to the aboriginal patients who are enrolled in CTZ program. So what that means is non-PBS medication becomes PBS for them. Even the medicine who are, which are not in the list becomes PBS for them. PBS medication becomes free medication for them. So this is more like our, in simple terms, what you can say is they get even more discount. So that is called closing the gap. And so the, one of the reasons we are asking, are you um, are you of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander origin is because we want to know if they have high risk of certain medical condition or if you can offer them additional help available under the government scheme. Sometimes it's also done to offer them the interpreter services or to offer them cultural officers, cultural liaison officer. So these are the reasons why we ask these questions. And if you have asked this question and if you have, the patient has said, yes, I identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, or if the question itself says that you have an ATSI patient, try to include this, these points in your discussion when you are presenting. Does okay. that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hello, doctor. I Hello. have a question. Yeah. Sure. Hey, in case of, I have a, a bit confusion. Is that a, that you have already told a bit more? Is, uh, if the panel sometimes uh, told, okay, your patient is stable, then mm -hmm. I start the history in taking after history, after taking history portion and after a few initial part of examination, I found the patient pulse, which is a bit more, patient has bilateral crafts. So in that case, I think patient might have referral, maybe urgent mm -hmm. or immediate referral. In that case, I will, in case of history portion, I will take a focus history only, or I would, I would like to go for details, history, like social and familial, as well as the in details. So uh, generally speaking in the exam, you need to stay focused. In general practice, history taking is almost always focused history taking. And um, you, you if especially if you feel like the patient has an acute presentation, because you need to identify what you need to do for the patient. Does the patient go to the hospital or the patient goes back to the community? That's why you consider these things. Now, depending on the stability of the patient, you have to change the, your approach for the patient. And um, as you get more information, you start suspecting that the, maybe the patient is not stable and this is an emergency condition. Then in yeah. such cases, I will stay focused. If I feel like this is a routine case where they're assessing my interviewing skills, I'll go yeah. asking questions in detail. Okay, okay. But but uh, but initially I ask, ask, the, ask the panel how the patient is stable or not. They told us yes. it's stable. Actually, this yes. patient is stable, but acute patient that you are right. In case of, I will be focused. That yes. is your advice. Okay. As an Thank example, you. this was uh, one of my exam cases was similar. This that was the case of Addison's disease. So they told me that there is a lady who has been vomiting as, uh, for the last two three days, and then has mild abdominal pain as well. And, um, and then uh, no no just just mild abdominal pain. I don't think they said vomiting at that time. So um, because it was mild abdominal pain, I started asking questions about abdominal pain mostly. Okay, so and mild abdominal pain, I did not even consider that as an emergency. So I did not even ask about a stability because I don't did not feel that that was important. So I started asking questions. I asked a lot of questions and she gave me some fi positive findings. And I felt that maybe this is a case of acid peptic disease or peptic ulcer disease. And so I started asking questions in that line and I finished history taking. And the only I, I was almost clueless by the time I reached the end of the history because the, the findings were so mixed. There were some positive findings. And retrospectively, I feel like I missed some positive clues they had given. But at that time in the exam, it did not occur to me that it could be one of the, uh, Edison's disease could be one of the possibilities. I was biased. I was thinking about just this um, peptic ulcer disease. And then my suspicion became stronger when they told me that the patient has been taking aspirin for their joint pain and was taking prednisolone for a long time, which they stopped one week, one month ago. So again, I was thinking like, okay, NSAID increases the risk of peptic ulcer disease and patient has been taking steroid for a long time. That also increases the risk of peptic ulcer disease. So I was only thinking in that line. So I was think, asking questions about the complications of anemia because of the increased blood loss. And some of the findings were also matching, like the patient was feeling dizzy, and the patient had mild abdominal pain, usually at just basically around the uh, the um, belly button area. So most of the things, because I was thinking from that perspective, I was biased that this is a case of um, um, a, a 
peptic ulcer disease with the um, ongoing GI blood loss leading to anemia as the complication, perhaps iron deficiency anemia as well. So I was thinking in that in that line, and then they asked me to do the examination, but I was structured. Although I did not know what I was doing, and I was feeling a bit clueless about what could be the possible diagnosis, I still stayed structured. I asked all the routine questions. I reached the examination part. In the examination, I asked all the questions and so on. And then suddenly, I uh, when I started talking about what I would do, how I would I, I would examine the patient, I said I would examine hands, face, mouth. And then I said inside the mouth, I'll check for any kind of rashes, any kind of uh, lesions. And then suddenly they said though in the in the buccal mucosa there are hyperpigmentation. So this was something given by the panel. And suddenly my it clicked to me that oh hyperpigmentation, buccal mucosa. So are we looking at additions? And suddenly, retrospectively, everything started making sense. Patient was on a steroid, was discontinued suddenly one month ago. And then, so that was iatrogenic additions disease. And then they had also told me in the vitals examination, and then that is the another reason, that is another reason I said, always say that you will do the general appearance and vital signs. Because generally what happens is when you fix saying what you want to do in the physical examination, they will tell you positive findings for only the things you mention in the physical examination. If you miss anything, they will not give you any findings for that. So for example, if I had missed mouth, they would not have told me what was inside mouth. So anyway, they told me about the mouth and then suddenly it made sense to me that, okay, patient has orthostatic hypertension, patient has hyperpigmentation in the history, patient has been taking history for a long time, which they stopped a month ago, that is Addison's disease. So I told them this is a case of Addison's disease. Now you see, the patient has severe orthostatic hypertension. And you know that patient of Addison's disease with severe orthostatic hypertension has to go to the hospital for the management. There is not much we can do in the general practice clinic. So what I told, and then they asked me like, what one test do you want to do in this patient? And then we have to, I had to tell them about the test. After that, they asked me, okay, the test, um, the, so based on the result of this test. Now, see, they are still not asking me what you want to do to the patient. They did not ask me, do you want to send the patient to the hospital or not? They asked me about the test. So you see, this is different than what actually happens in the clinic. In the clinic, if I had the suspicion that the patient had Addison's disease, I would simply send the patient to the hospital. I would not be doing the investigation and wait for the result. So there, they, because that would be my practical approach, that's why they first asked me, like, what investigation do you think we should do in Addison's disease? And after I talked about the ACTS test, they, then they told me about the diagnosis. Okay. And they, they asked me, like, what is your diagnosis now? So I, they, I said that I think this is a case of Addison's disease. And then after that, what do you want to do? That's what they asked me. So see, so after only after all these things, they asked me, what do you want to do? Then I say that I have to send to send the patient to the hospital. And then, then they ask me, oh, what happens in the hospital? What medication do they give in the hospital? So I talked about that. So I mean to say that because they want to see about, they want to check whether you know certain things or not. Sometimes they will change the, change the uh, case a little bit and they will directly ask you the question so that you don't skip that part so that they can see whether you know about those things or not. Otherwise, if they had asked me practically, what would you do? After the examination and making the diagnosis, I would have sent the patient to the hospital without doing any investigation myself. So that, does it make sense what I'm trying to say? So you, you as a candidate have to know uh, what your approach should be. But if they want to ask you anything, they will ask. So you don't need to worry about that part. You, as a candidate, just do a structured presentation without worrying about anything. Okay, any other questions? Dr. Roman, in case of Addison disease, we did not give the any uh, hydrocortisone IV in the uh, GB clinic or after the, uh, the test? We don't have that. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we don't have that in our clinic. So um, in, in this case, the patient actually, uh, hydrocortisone is important in Addison's disease, but this patient had severe orthostatic hypertension. So in these cases, we need to uh, do the mineralocorticoid before uh, we do the hydrocortisone. We'll be doing hydrocortisone as well. So the patient requires fludrocortisone, which has more mineralocorticoid properties. And long-term, the patient will be put on hydrocortisone. So that was the reason I wanted to send the patient to the hospital. 
So I said the same thing to them. So uh, the, other, the other thing is, if you have a rational and if you know why you are doing a particular step you are doing, that's all what we say. Um, that's what we say, a clinical reasoning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Rum. No problem at all. Any Anyone else, any other questions? I didn't try to go into too much detail because most of these conditions, how to approach them and those kind of things we'll be discussing in our live session anyway from tomorrow. Um, and those of you who are already enrolled, we'll have this discussion uh, in our upcoming sessions. We'll have a lot of discussions about different cases which have been asked, and then you'll have multiple opportunities to ask those questions. But for the rest uh, who just want to know how to start the preparation, or maybe you have already taken courses somewhere, you just want to know about a different approach to the cases, feel free to ask the questions. Anything, anything, not just the GP emergency cases, but anything. No one has any question that is really good or maybe really bad. Excuse me, doctor. And you mean, Hello? I don't know if this is relevant for the discussion, but uh, you mentioned that you have you suspicious early about the peptic cast disease. In examination, mm -hmm. if I were there, I wouldn't ask about uh, oral mucosa because it's not relevant to uh, relevant with dehydration or so. How could you think that way? Or how how is how you make your structure way like that? Because if uh, okay, so in this case, why did I ask about oral mucosa? Now mm -hmm. I was only asking a. Uh, I, I was only asking because I was thinking about anemia and I also wanted to make sure that I was not missing other possibilities of anemia. And because I was thinking about um, the anemia, I was thinking if, uh, to check the gum hypertrophy because I was going in a completely different direction, as you can imagine. So I think that I was a bit lucky to check inside the mouth because I was not thinking about Addison's disease. I was not checking mucosa for Addison's disease. But the reason I'm saying I was structured was because I checked the hands first and then I checked the head. That's how you I usually start hand, head, body, and then relevant parts as 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 relevant for the case. Uh, so here I check the hand and the head. I check the eyes and then I said I would check the mouth. I would check the angle of the mouth and also inside the mouse mouth. That that was all I said. I didn't say what I was going to check inside the mouth. Because the uh, only thing I had in my mind was some gum hypertrophy and those kind of things. So, uh, and then glossitis for for uh, the vitamin B12 deficiency. So I was thinking in that line only. But somehow, uh, because I, I mentioned that I would check inside the mouth, they gave me the positive finding. So maybe I was a bit lucky there. But... As long as you keep your st approach structured and then check the relevant um, organs, even if you are not sure which uh, what you are expecting from that particular area, you might get some positive findings there. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? And does that answer your question, doctor? Yes, doctor. You are excellent. Uh, methodical way is very nice. That's... Thank you Thank for you. giving these opportunities to us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question uh, about check for study for Pesky. Now, when I prepared, I used Check magazine. Now, those of you who may not know what Check is, Check is a monthly, I, actually it's published every two months. So it's a magazine compiled by RCGP, which is available to RCGP members. So RCGP has membership system for students, uh, GP registrars and practicing general practitioners, they have different rates. You can become a member and you can read these magazines. Are they good? Yes. Should you read them for Pesky? Uh, depends. Now, if you are doing self-preparation, then I think it will benefit you. 
when I was preparing, I was doing self-preparation and I used these Czech magazines and it's still I read them. Uh, every time new issue comes, I go through the magazine, I find out whatever is relevant for my practice and I write them down in my notes. If someone is uh, doing a structured courses, let that be the course I'm running or the courses others are running, then I don't think you will have to spend another um, extra hours uh, or extra time doing the check magazine. It's really time consuming. One check magazine will require you uh, to spend around six hours according to RCGP. So if you have that much amount of time and if you think that reading check once will be enough for you because you have good background knowledge, then of course do it, but it comes at a cost. Otherwise, um, I think um, if you have been taking, if at least what I can say is if you have been taking my course, don't worry about check because I use all the information from um, different sources, including check. So if anything new comes in check, then I include that information as relevant in my lectures and in my notes as well. Uh, for the others, you might benefit, but it is quite time consuming. Uh, but if you love reading, then perhaps you can go for it. By the way, those of you who are preparing to be a general practitioner in Australia, you know there are a lot of free resources as well. As I said, RSGP membership costs money. So those of you who are not in a financial position to pay for the membership cost at the moment, you still have good resources out there. I'll just write this in the chat, uh, in the chat box. Um, just um, you maybe note, you can note it down and then maybe uh, check them up. Uh, the first one is ThinkGP. Many of you already know about ThinkGP, I guess. ThinkGP is an excellent resource for uh, many of the Australian related uh, general practice related guidelines, Australian general practice related guidelines, ThinkGP. The second one is PraxHub. PraxHub also has many uh, free lessons. Have a look. Uh, it's completely free. The third one is HealthEd. This is also completely free. Health Ed also you can access. There are multiple presentations about different conditions and you can have a look. Health Cert is not free. Health Cert is not completely free, but there are some free lessons. So you can just check those free lessons. And I don't think you'll have more time to check any other resources. If you go through P Prax Hub, Health Ed, and uh, think CP, I think it is more than enough. And another thing is every time you do these resources, make sure that you are keeping uh, uh, a record of your CPD points. When you will be applying for APRA registration later on, you can use these CPD points to prove that you have been doing something and this will be helpful for your registration. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, these are some of the resources that you can use in addition to check. They are really good. Praxub is is prepared in a very simple manner. It's very easy to understand. I enjoy their presentations. And I often use them to learn myself about different things, which I try to include in my practice as well as in my course. What are the last uh, the last uh, source, uh, Dr. Roman? He health, what? Health, what? Health cert. It's, it's, for, it's the short form for health certificate. So it's health cert. Okay. I have just typed it in the chat box as well. Health cert. Thank you. Um, these are the only I can remember at the moment. If I come across anything else, I will share in the AMC Tutor general group as well so that you can have a look. But yeah. Um, so yeah, keep practicing. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, get in touch with me. I try as much as possible to answer your questions. That can be about PESKI, about AMC Clinic, or just about getting jobs in how to get ready for practicing in Australia. Feel free to get in touch. I know this is really stressful uh, for all of us. I have been there. I have been through the situation myself. And that's why I always feel like, I always feel obliged to answer your questions. I often feel that if only in my time there were people who could guide me and to, could tell me the right thing to do, I could have saved myself a lot of you know, hassles and perhaps could have saved myself time and money as well. So I feel like um, whenever someone asks me these questions, I feel obliged to answer the questions. Now, yes, because of my work these days, I don't get as much free time as I used to get. Uh, but it's still, I try to stay active on uh, Saturday and Sunday if I'm not with my family. So, of course, I have family and I need to spend time with them. But usually in the morning and in the evening, I check all the messages. I try to answer your questions. I've also been trying to answer your questions about AMC clinical cases. Uh, I have been preparing the notes and sharing with uh, sharing them with you. I hope you have been benefiting from them. 
And yes, feel free to get in touch. And don't worry, if you need any help, um, I'm here to help you as much as I can. So with that, I think I would wrap up today's session. Those of you who are already in the course, you'll find the link to tomorrow's course updated on the portal. And I'll also tell you uh, either to tonight or tomorrow morning what case discussions we are going to do tomorrow. Our case discussion will start from 6 and we'll go until 8.30 tomorrow. Until that time, if you don't have any other questions, I'm signing off. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for um, listening to me patiently. Thank you so much. And I'll see you when I will see you next time with another webinar. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm Maria, it's in the Pesky portal. All right, guys. Um, good night.